Welcome to our premium SUV comparison episode with the BMW X5, with the BMW X6 versus the Mercedes GLE SUV and Coupe versus Audi Q8 with Audi Q7 versus Porsche Cayenne versus Range Rover Sport versus VW Touareg versus Volvo XC90. Which one of these ones would I pick? Which one would you pick? Which one has which pros and cons? Let's dig into the details, let's go. It's time to take a detailed look and drive the updated BMW X5. Is it actually better than its competitors? And what has changed with this facelift? Let's find out together with Thomas Nautigefühl in 4K, full screen and full length. Let's go here with the updated BMW double kidney. A massive stance, yeah, it has become bigger and bigger, but I think that way it still fits to the vehicle. It's not like this mono kidney we know from the iX or something. The X-Line would be based now. They lifted the standard equipment. X-Line has bright accentuations in the lower part. This is here the optional M Sport Pack. So we have black accentuations in the Sport here styling. And if you would go for the M Sport Package Pro, then also the whole double kidney with frame and the fins here would be all blacked out. But I think that way it looks a little bit more elegant. Updated also with the headlamps, new signature in this arrow styling. And if you activate the turning indicators, then it has this pulsing effect, looks very interesting. Also on the light side, new. Before it was only with the X6, now also the X5 gets the optional iconic glow, the illuminated double kidney. Even while driving, it shines from the top part down then like a light waterfall. The length at 4 meters 94 or 194 inches, that has remained the same. New wheel stylings from 19 to 22 inch. These here are already 21 inch wheels, already in this M style, pretty massive. And the M Sport package here visible at the side and with these black accentuations. Dravid Gray is the color for today, actually. As for suspension technology, the adaptive suspension is standard and for most cases, this will be totally fine. If you have the M Sport Pack, then this suspension is set a little bit stiffer and you can get it even stiffer, some like that, yeah, in the Adaptive M Suspension Professional. That is then also combined with more technology like a rear axle differential, you have rear axle steering, anti-tilt control and so on, everything in one pack. However, this rear axle steering, you can also get separately like this vehicle has here. And then the rear wheels turn in the opposite direction than the front wheels, three, between three and four degrees, massively reducing the turning circle. And with this facelift here, they did an update that the rear axle steering reacts earlier at very, very slow speeds. Not at standstill, like we know from Mercedes. They don't do it here because say it applies too much force to moving parts and it wouldn't be good for long-term durability. But as long as you move really, really slowly when parking in and out, then it reacts earlier now to make it even easier for you for the whole parking process and so on. And then there's the optional air suspension. You would go for that one if you want the widest span between comfort and sportiness. That is standard, by the way, for the plug-in hybrid model. In the rear, the facelift adds new lamp design for the rear LED and it forms this X when you take left and right side together. Overall, a very clean rear design. Hmm, you have the six-cylinder plug-in hybrid here today and then... <whistles> fake exhaust police, out of fake exhaust police because the outer tip is fake, real exhaust on the inside. It always depends on the engine and so on. It goes through, but yeah, what's your take on that? And two more differences between the M Sport and the X line. In the M Sport pack, we have the wheel arches in vehicle color and also the lower bumper is in vehicle color. Whereas in the X line, once again, we would have a gray or silver contrast at the rear as well as these more classic off-road plastic wheel arches. And the updated turning indicators or hazard lights also get this pulsing effect now little bit more spectacular. By the way, sorry for the massive wind here today. You can maybe see it with my hair or with the trees and so on. I hope it's still okay from the sound quality for you. This vehicle is equipped with the M Sport Pack, so you also get the M Colors at the key fob. Then, vehicle door closing sound. Mmm, that's great. Really solid door closing sound, I like that. 
Then ins and outer doors, also very well built from the whole interior build quality. This is indeed very convincing. It's also a well-developed vehicle meanwhile. M Sportback also gets the M steering wheel. That one is not yet available with any leather alternative. And you already see these two screens there. New digital cockpit layout, soon more to that. These are the comfort seats. You either have sport seats or comfort seats. The comfort seats are a little bit wider and indeed offer more comfort. And this special stitching here is always when it comes with the sensor fin that is now standard. This is like a very highly elaborated leatherette, so no animal material on the seat. And it is really soft and comfortable, so I can just recommend that. You just have something to gain from that. So well done. Different colors are available, also bright styling, for example. Then, 189 or 6 foot 2, there's a lot of headroom left. You also either have a manual steering control, or in this case here, we also have the electric one. So for tall adults, no problem at all. It's one of the most comfortable SUVs out there, especially here with the comfort seats. Many new vehicles go for cost savings nowadays. This one doesn't. Look at that. Here, when this small cubby hole with this opening falls down this compartment, super softly dampened, and also when you close it, a very nice resonating closing sound. Interior cockpit overview with this face of here, pro and con. It looks cleaner, it is cleaner. 12.3 inch, 14.9 inch, curved display, one unit that looks cool, but you miss the manual climate knobs here for plus and minus. You still have the vent control here, yes, but to control the temperature, you have to plus minus that here. Hmm, okay, two plus or two minus something. That's interesting English for me, yeah. Um, whatever, you understood what I meant. For the vent strength, then you have to go into the climate menu. So that is the downside to me. However, this BMW OS8, or to be exact, OS 8.5 it is now, has, for example, an advantage. Apple Maps in Apple CarPlay can also be displayed here on the left side. It would also work with Google Maps here when you have an Android phone and then Google Maps here. When I use Google Maps here, I can also show that to you. Google Maps then here on the right side with CarPlay. That's interesting. Now I have Google Maps on the right and Apple Maps on the left. Wow. <laughs> that's an interesting finding for today. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's live on Autogefu. This OS 8.5 has a new home screen. What they, for example, did is they made it easier for you to switch to the CarPlay and so on. Like here you have different possibilities, different hotkeys. Most actually directs you then to CarPlay or Maps uh, and so on. So I think that's also what most people are using. And the climate unit here up close, this also newly designed. There you can go for the vent strength and change some of the other settings. And seat heating, instead heated steering wheel is hidden here. What I appreciate, still real buttons at the steering wheel. Also the volume knob is still manual. Of course, you can also get a head-up display. And look at that, three quarters of the battery is full and says 76 kilometers, so a little bit less than 100 kilometers or 60 miles when the battery is completely full is somewhat realistic. And even more impressive, the overall range then close to 1,000 kilometers or 600 miles when everything is full, fuel and battery. A nice way to reduce high gloss black is here the carbon fiber decal element. You slide this open, cup holders adaptive, also cooled and heated. That's fancy. And then the inductive charging pad. Yeah, that gets too hot actually because there's no cooling function for that. They did not do that with that facelift. And here in this middle console, you still have this control knob for the infotainment system that you do not have to use touch. However, this new shifting lever that looks cleaner and is just flatter in the integration has the downside that it doesn't have this typical BMW sporty shifting lever. And if you have the air suspension, you can also manually set the level then here when you, for example, go off or driving or something or want to lower the car for loading in and out. And you now have the ambient lighting integration right here. That looks pretty fancy. I like that. You can also, of course, change the colors. Um, yeah whatever you prefer, dim it for night driving or not. I usually have it all the way bright also while driving at night. What, what do you think about this? Rear compartment, also solid build quality at the rear doors here with soft touch and so on. And then, well, this is one of the drawbacks here. 
when you think about this X1 review recently again, it has the same legroom like an X1. And you wonder about the package. Yeah, it's because you also can fit so big engines there in the front. However, it is sufficient for five tall adults. So even here on the middle seat, it works. It's a little bit stiffer than overall, but even height-wise, it's no problem at all. So it does indeed five house five tall adults. The X5, by the way, also offers the third seating row for a seven-seater option. If it makes so much sense in an X5, maybe as emergency seats. However, it's not available for the plug-in hybrid here as for space reasons. Then you can also fold down this armrest and then you, for example, have some cup holders here. They are also somewhat adaptive. As for the trunk, special to the X5 is always this split hatch that you have the additional lower hatch, the manual cover on top. Well, this lower hatch is cool for picnic sessions here. You can even, you know, sit down together here with two people, so it's no problem as for the weight. The only disadvantage would be uh, for the button here, when you stand in front of it and you can actually hit the button easily with your leg here. So uh, when you stand, like this is, you know, see, I just hit it then with my leg. That can happen unintentionally and when you then have your picnic equipment all the way distributed here, that might end <laughs> not so good. Well, but then it's nice dimensions, over a meter of 40 inches in width, a little bit less than a meter of 40 inches in length and the height is about 80 centimeters or 30 inches. Folding the seats is not that easy from here. They have removed this electric function so you have to go around. Yeah, but that is then quite easily done. Then you have the full length indeed, but overall a very well usable trunk. Also really nice quality wise here, this compartment with a gas strut. So that's pretty cool as we'll build quality. Here, for example, when you have dogs, this additional net. The difference is that here the plug-in hybrid has over 500 liters. The non-plug-in hybrid, pure combustion, has 600 liters, but that's just the compartment underneath. Above here, plug-in hybrid and the normal combustion engines are more or less the same, so no compromise, just that you have to put the charging cable in somewhere if you want to carry it. As for engines, 3-liter inline 6-cylinder petrol and diesel and the 4.4-liter V8 in the M60i. This one here is the six-cylinder petrol engine. That is also the base for the plug-in hybrid. You can see it here at the orange cable. So everything is electrified. It's always signaled as orange for safety reasons, actually. Also when you work on the engine and so on. And this one here, really quick in the acceleration figure, is less than five seconds. So 4.8 in the German horsepower figure. That's just half a second slower than the V8 because here you have the combined power of the combustion engine and the electric motor that is integrated in the transmission, by the way, so it won't change the all-wheel drive distribution. When you have an all-wheel drive model, which most X5s are, then it still has a rear-wheel bias, and even so in the plug-in hybrid. This one here, the biggest update as for the facelift, because in general all the engines are at least mild hybrid now, and when you go for the plug-in hybrid, this one with a bigger battery now, now at 26 kilowatt hours net, that also increases the pure electric range, of course. So up to one kilometer or 60 miles, a little bit less depending on the situation then. And recharging, yes, you can always press the M logo for that when you have the M Sport Pack. 7.4 kilowatt AC, no DC charging. However, in four and a half hours with that kind of power, it's already full. Then. This plug-in hybrid is also somewhat of a performance version. Let's put to the sport mode and also sport or S shifting mode getting the boost from both drivetrains, combustion engine and electric drive. Let's go. Plop. That's already 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour. Wow, impressive. I mean, if you think about it, this is just half a second slower than the V8 and half a second quicker than the pure three liter inline six cylinder. And you still have that base engine under the hood, so you can enjoy this inline six cylinder, which is the world famous BMW engine, to me, also one of the best engines out there. When you drive it slowly, not like this, this was an acceleration test, you can also score some nine liters and one kilometers, 28 mbg US, 31 mbg UK, or 26 mbg US, something like that in that region, um, which is not super low, but definitely okay for this kind of a vehicle. 
And then of course you can always drive pure electric here with the plug-in hybrid with the 50e. This new electric motor has more power. So it's a completely new electric motor. As we've shown to you here, 4.8 seconds is the acceleration figure. And here in that sport mode, you're making use of that also with the red background there. So both powertrains. And you can also go back to the hybrid mode. And also from the S to the D shifting mode. Then everything calms down more silence and so on. So usually we're driving in a normal hybrid mode and then for example here when I hit the brake, combustion engine is shut off, everything electric, everything silent and because of the good noise insulation here you can also get the optional insulation package for, for that, it's also equipped with that vehicle. It is so super silent here in this vehicle so when you're standing at the traffic light it's super windy out there, you heard it earlier and you hear nothing from that when being on the inside. And this electric driving also fits to this vehicle. So when I'm, you know, like going to some rural traffic, I just start all electric. You have some kind of electric sound, but it's really drawn back. Of course, you also hear it from the outside at really slow speeds. And you can actually, oh, this. Um, you can also drive higher speeds, pure electric. That is possible just when you pin down, then of course, always the combustion engine. You can also see it in here in the instruments in which area you have to stay that we'd still drive all electric and if I would exceed that one then the combustion engine would be turned on. It is equipped with the adaptive recuperation and that means when there's no one in front of me and I leave my foot off the throttle the car is just rolling. No recuperation at all. If there is a car in front of me then and you know and like there's enough distance this is actually fine. But if there's a car in front of me and the distance is too close, or here now the car will decelerate, the speed limit changes, then you can see I lift my throttle, lift my foot of the throttle, and then here there's adaptive recuperation. So then you don't have to adjust the recuperation level, the car is doing that for you automatically. And there's always pro and con arguing that. The con is it's not that predictable. The pro is you don't have to care about recuperation levels and it's in a way a relaxing feature because when you don't have to use regenerative braking, you're just rolling. And when it makes sense, then it almost acts like an adaptive cruise control when there's a car in front of you, even without you having set it. So I think overall, it's a very intelligent feature to have. And you can see here, even some quick acceleration, pure electric is possible. And you even feel the gear shifts. That is unusual for electric car driving feeling, but the reason is that it sits in the transmission. That's the reason why you also feel the gear shifts, actually. And as the hybrid mode is laid out, most of the time you will first use all the electric drive. And when that's one that is depleted, then you will also use the combustion engine, unless you have these power moments. And why are they doing that? that the combustion engine gets activated at some point when you pin it down is basically a safety thing. So for example, I'm getting onto the German Autobahn and I see, oh, I need some more acceleration to get on that quicker and in a more safe way. Then it's actually making sense that I get the combustion engine power when I just pin it down in a, this panic moment. And then it's actually safer if I enter the motorway quicker or maybe do like an overtaking maneuver. And that's the reason why most manufacturers have this philosophy there. Actually, it's always available. But it's really fun to drive it also electric. It does fit to the vehicle. Suspension, you will be fine with the normal adaptive suspension. If you have a base X5 without being the plug-in hybrid, the adaptive suspension by BMW is great. It's more than enough. I would also not pick it in the sporty trim. Here the air suspension is standard for the plug-in hybrid because of the added weight by the battery. That's why they said to keep the level of the suspension of the vehicle. It's better when there's also the air suspension support. And at the same time, of course, with the air suspension, it gets a little bit stiffer than also in the sport mode, a little bit softer in the comfort mode. So you have more variety when you have an air suspension. But it's not, I would say, it is a needed feature in the BMW X5 because the adaptive suspension is so good already. Does it feel like a floaty air suspension? I would say no. It's rather set on a sporty note. So when I'm driving it now and someone would tell me, hey, it's a good adaptive suspension and it's no air suspension, I couldn't deny that, you know. So 
doesn't feel so floaty air suspension like but it feels really good considering we have 21 inch wheels on that one it's a very comfortable ride indeed and most of the time you will leave it in the normal hybrid driving mode seats here also long-term comfort is excellent here once again the combination the sensor fin high grade of the red with the comfort seat the comfort seat will give you more comfort especially in the us for example it has a higher take rate than the base sport seat in germany the sport seat take rate is a little bit higher yeah you know some germans like it stiffer <laughs> yeah <laughs> so and now german motorway here once again just over 100 kilometers an hour 60 miles an hour now we can drive a little bit quicker super silent very well insulated so you almost feel like you would be rather in a low seating sedan as for the noise or NVH comfort that's also one thing I really like about the X5 you could go miles and miles and miles without getting lower back fatigue or something and it's still fun and it's also still sporty when you do some lane change here to the right for example it's really nice I feel the steering feel is also good and strangely the steering feel in the bigger BMW SUVs is better than in a lot of their sporty vehicles and I still wonder why is that I have no idea so in the X5 it has one of the best steering fields in, in the BMW model portfolio it should be the other way around I mean it should all also be good you know or all should be good but yeah strangely that this is the case then here by the way are we still driving electric no we can see that here in that you know in the power meter let's drop it a little bit see when it does switch back to electric again there we are so here so we would drive 125 100, yeah, 125 kilometers an hour and if i go a little bit quicker let's see here yeah now the combustion engine is on so around 130 kilometers an hour that's like 70 80 miles an hour that is then the threshold for the pure electric driving and of course we can drive even quicker and here now unlimited speed on the german autobahn let's see Wow, it's still so silent in here. Can't believe that. 170 kilometers an hour and super stable also on the road and it doesn't feel like a high, floaty, big SUV. It feels like a sport sedan comparing, of course, only if you go to some very narrow corners with high speed, then, of course, you can't deny the fact. The Porsche Cayenne will still be sportier in a way, especially moving through the corners. So in sportiness, this one doesn't attack the can, maybe the high-end M versions then, of course. As for the Audi, it has also a nice sporty, balanced driving feeling for sure. The BMW X5 feels a little more sophisticated as for the luxurious features. The Mercedes GLE, that is meanwhile, the, the thing is, it's still a nice very, very vehicle, definitely, but also here the X5 feels like it would be so much more premium than the Mercedes GLE. I really have to say that, especially while driving, the X5 gives you a very sophisticated feeling. And I wouldn't even necessarily go for an X7. They are sharing the same platform. The X7 makes sense for you if you need more space in the back there and making use of the third seating row, for example. There is also the third seating row available for the X5, but I don't think it's that necessary. And yeah, I'm just keeping on my moderation so easily while I'm driving 160 kilometers an hour, so like 100 miles per hour, and it's just so effortless. Here with the upgrade, the facelift upgrade, mild hybrid technology for the normal combustion engines does give you some advantages as for the consumption, but not the super game changer. Here for the plug-in hybrid, of course, one thing we saw initially, just more power from that electric motor. And the other thing is then the upgraded battery, more size, and then yeah, we can really score some good range figures, pure electric, and also together with the combustion engine. So to me, one big advantage of the plug-in hybrid is also this combined range that you just have, is this here? Okay. There's a nice saying in Germany, especially like the area where I'm from, where, you know, like has some coal mining background and People used to be, let's say, some, um, you know, straight, very straightforward people, you know, living there. Um, and then in situations like these, you would say like, Alter, this is kein Parkplatz here. 
or like, hey dude, this is not a, not a parking lot. <laughs> so, in, you know, referring to that you don't drive so fast on the parking lot, of course. This is still a German Autobahn. Um, you know, you don't have to race. At least you should then pull over to the right when you don't want to drive that fast. Because the most important thing is always to keep distance to the car in front of you. Then you can also drive fast. Assistant systems, flawless. I mean, look at that. Yeah, the lane keeping assist, the active one, really no hectic movement, but keeps the lane and also really centralized and just slight movements from the steering wheel. Cruise control, of course, keeps the distance in the car in front of you. Yes, that's also done by the adaptive recuperation assistant here in that case with the X550e, the plug-in hybrid. And then there's also the active lane changing and you induce that by hitting the turning indicators just like tipping it like this and then you can see here car does it itself and gets in the lane and then the lane chain is done you might also ask yourself why would you let the car do this um, yeah, it's here by the way there's someone in behind me then I have to do it myself because the car says hey that's not enough distance for me and I also had this vibration in the steering wheel and the car was not changing the lane because there was someone approaching from the rear. So actually very well thought out, very elaborated assistance systems also. You feel that this car has been built for a couple of years and with its facelift they try to you know perfectionize it even more and more. Exterior wise I like the changes but I'm also totally fine with the pre-facelift. Interior it's definitely pro and con. The infotainment system looks cleaner and it is significantly quicker. So it is the better software on the other hand, you lose the manual climate knobs and it's a little bit more complex, so that's definitely pro and con. My favorite are the seats here, especially the ones we had here today, the comfort seats with the sensor fin, this combination, among the most comfortable seats overall in the industry. Driving-wise, as flawless as ever, as we can expect from the X5, the plug-in hybrid especially now even more upgraded with this higher electric range. So. Indeed, if you compare it to the competitors, Mercedes GLE, Audi Q8 and so on, I think the X5 is at that moment one of the best picks you have. Especially also, recent consumer reports rankings, that BMW is very good in the reliability score just behind Toyota and Lexus. And, you know, people have been saying, yeah, you know, they're money pits and so on, they're not reliable, they drive great, but they're not reliable. But it seems that BMW stepped up the game also as for the reliability, whereas other German manufacturers went down there a little bit in the reliability rankings. So that's also a very important factor to consider, of course. Today I have the Mercedes GLE facelift for you, including a driving part with Thomas in 4K full screen, full length. Let's go with the front with new headlamps, new signature, and then we have the optional multi-beam LED, four dot design right here white vehicle in AMG line. Then you have this one horizontal spoke, whereas the base Mercedes GLE has two horizontal spokes. Here the AMG line also comes with this micro star pattern and also a different graphic in the lower side part, whereas the base version once again would have a more subtle look. The front indicators here replace the data running light. That looks quite fancy, doesn't it? In the driving part later on, we will compare and drive GLS 450 versus GLE 53. The length at 4 meters 92 or 194 inches has remained the same. Wheels now start bigger, 19 inch up to 22 inch. These here are somewhat in between 21 inch, but already massive enough from the looks. AMG line has the wheel arches and vehicle color, whereas the baseline. Yo, baseline has it in the crossover wheel arches. And typical for GLE is always this design graphic right here. As for suspensions, you start with the base steel suspension, but that one already has adaptive dampers. Optional airmatic air suspension, we also have it here. And optional, optional, the e active body control it can also lean in the corner so we can go this low rider style and so on. We'll have the normal air suspension for today. The rear with new tail lamps, and when you have the AMG line, then you have this high gloss black in the lower part. And <whistles> our local fake exhaust police is reporting another set of fake exhaust. And a quick look at the turning indicators, not that spectacular. And as a comparison, this is the 63 model, 63S. Now gets the logo on top of the hood, the AMG logo, and here 53 and 63 get the AMG front grille with the vertical fins. 
53 and 63 are different in the lower side part here where the 63 looks a little bit more massive. You can go up to 22 inch. Here you can also see the 22 inch in the AMG styling, really massive. Here also with the optional carbon ceramic brake. And in the rear you have this diffuser style in the central part and the exhaust tips. Yeah, real one is on the inside. The outer fuel fake exhaust police is always watching for you. The fake safe changes also account for the GLE Coupe and it always starts in the AMG line. This is here a 53 model, so it also has a true AMG grille. But these sides here in the lower part, this is the same in AMG line and also in the 53 model. The coupe always, of course, characterized by this falling roof line. It does split opinions. Are you team love or team hate? As for the SUV coupe thing, tell me in the comments. In the US, by the way, the coupe only available as GLE 53 or 63. On the European markets, you have a wider engine choice also for the coupe version. Key fob in matte black and not high gloss black piano like I prefer that way actually. Door closing sound. Really solid light and also the panel gaps well built. Inside of the doors, I prefer these models here from Mercedes where you still have a haptic feedback at the seat controls and not without the feedback here. Also styling elements you can also find in a GLS for example with this deco element. Also news taken from a GLS, even from the Maybach, is here the galvanized tops here at the air vents on the left side and that goes throughout the vehicle. New steering wheel. Looks pretty fancy, this the base steering wheel, but then hash the capacitive BS buttons. So I think I preferred the previous one in that case. With an AMG line or true AMG, you also get the two horizontal spokes then at the steering wheel. Dual insulation glass here, by the way. Seats here, the animal skin. How do you see it? One, two, three, four, five, six patterns here. The Artico MBTX has four patterns. Yeah, other than that, it's hard to differentiate. The Artico available in black, gray, and also new brown color updated. 189 or 6 for 2 is the headroom here. It's a good command driving position indeed. GLS and GLE don't differ so much in the front driving position. It's more about the rear differences then. In here overview, you can see this galvanization here at the design element and also here now at the air vent, so a little bit improved quality. Different decor elements available here. To me, it's a little bit too much high gloss black piano lacquer. I would prefer a matte wood. What would you? To me, always very important that you can still set the climbing tool manually and with a very rich clicking sound. MUX infotainment system update. I think it's quicker than before, just more responsive. And Apple CarPlay, also wireless. Of course, also Android Auto works. Burmester sound system tries to be, you know, this very true sound, keeping to the original source. I like the sound indeed. And there's then also this new off-road mode available. You have here this off-road view, and then also a special off-road camera, live feed around that. And as soon as you go forward here, it builds up this past camera image. And there you can see I'm going over this puddle here, for example. So you always see if there's something between the tires to prevent damage. The head-up display is indeed a very impressive one. Look at how large it is, very clear as well. And you also have off-road head-up display eco you can have different settings there a standard one reduced or a sporty head-up display so much to choose from and the digital instruments with integrated map from the car internal gps or map full screen and my favorite are the new off-road gauges here that just looks coolest from the visualization or once again go classic or with the sporty gauges. Middle console and the front one, you slide this one open, inductive charging pad. The cup holders are not holding the bolts too tight, but you can cool or heat them, that's pretty cool. Then you have here this touch pad where you can use alternatively to the touch screen, so you can also control the infotainment, driving mode selection here, and and you have the air suspension, that option, you can also lower or raise the vehicle manually. Last but not least, this split armrest. Panoramic roof is really wide and you can also open it completely. Really like also this crystalline look here of the top inside interior lamps. And here we go. Let's go a little bit further. That's it. Rear bench. Actually, the door opens quite wide, so you have easy access and also for child seats and so on. Isofix at the outside parts. The bench is quite short and also folds backward a little bit. 
that's maybe to me not the best in comfort also if you compare it to for example the BMW X5 but what is better here is the legroom because of the design of the rear bench you have more legroom actually than in some of the competitors that's actually decent and the headroom also for tall people no problem at all the middle seating here is surprisingly soft in the middle part for the seating area just a little bit stiff than here from this back area and you now also have two USB-C chargers at the rear. The trunk, 825 liters up to over 2000 liters. You have here this cover, which doesn't have rails at the side because you can also get a seven seater for the GLE, but I think it doesn't make any sense more than in the GLS. Here, the width is actually quite good, 110 or 44 inches, and the normal length is about a meter or 40 inches. So that's good. And the total height here is 85 centimeters or 33 inches very good measurements to fold the seats you have to grab over here um, it is possible though and if you went for the amg line or have a true amg model 5363 then you have the steering wheel here with two horizontal spokes this is also the one with the microfiber sides can really recommend it you can also get different decor elements like the carbon fiber here and also sportier seats also with some microfiber share at least but you can also get depending from market to market, a full Dynamica microfiber on the inside than with the AMG line or the 53 model at least. Rear headroom in the coupe, the panoramic roof is not as long and so it rises here again towards the rear and then you see still enough headroom left indeed. And a quick comparison to the boot or trunk of the coupe, length width, more or less the same of course and here the different cover the difference is that you lose height here in that latter area in most cases you will be able to live with that engine lineup two liter four cylinders petrol and diesel three liter six cylinder petrol and diesel four liter v8 petrol engine in the 580 or in the 63 model the 53 model gets also the three liter six cylinder to me, the sweet spot is the 3 liter 6 liter petrol engine in the GLE 450 indeed. You can also get base engine, for example, in the US with the 350, that one even just with rear wheel drive. News is that all are equipped now with mild hybrid system and plug-in hybrids are also available, both petrol and diesel. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the Mercedes GLS 450 facelift. 381 horsepower now mild hybrid system and 5.6 seconds is the acceleration figure to my goodness now or 62 miles an hour air suspension already helps here in city driving to even out some bumps and so on i wouldn't say that it is a super soft setup you do feel still it's an air suspension that's good um but it's also not that it's leaning too much in the corners. Very interesting is I found that with an earlier driving test, GLE and GLS, that when you have the e-active body control, it's also feeling a little bit stiffer. You know, you have this leaning into the corner possibility then. At the same time, I feel that you lose a little bit of comfort just, you know, from this evening out things. That was quite quick to 35 miles an hour well that went well so this engine here is definitely more than sufficient as for the power uh, do you really need an amg version of course it's a different kind of thing but for most use cases this is totally fine as for the acceleration here in the corner you can see doesn't lean too much from the air suspension but the seats actually don't hold you that tight there is also, depending on the market spec, the Dynamica microfiber available. It's like a microfiber on the inside. It exists in the AMG line, if that's available in your market. And this one actually keeps you a little bit tighter in the seat, so I can recommend that. Then now here on the motorway, 65 miles an hour, so around 100 kilometers an hour. Noise insulation is really good, it's very silent in here. You've also seen the dual insulation glass at first. In the sport mode, already when you have the base suspension, the suspension goes a little bit stiffer. Here in the Airmatic air suspension, of course, even more so. And you can go back from the drive mode select to the comfort mode. Then the suspension is evening out the waves, for example, a little bit softer, a little bit better. You can drive in any mode it will still be fine actually. As for the assistance systems, setting in here on the left side of the steering wheel, there is this active lane keeping assist. See here it's not too proactive. I had to correct myself now. Now it's catching it. There we go. 
So here now I'm being kept in the lane. Of course, I'll never trust it 100%, for example, when it's a Mika at the side or something. But it can be something to, let's say, relax a little bit more on the motorway. Just keep your hands in the steering wheel and then let the car do like the, the fine nuances and so on. How does it behave in a lane change? It's really nice, very smooth indeed. And steering uh, doesn't have a dead zone area. There is always reaction and it actually feels quite natural. And in agile driving corners, we'll see, is it also sporty fun in the riding? And for the agile driving part here, countryside, I go once again to the sport mode to give us a little bit more feedback from the suspension. Let's see difference here, steering, comfort mode, sport. Yeah, I also get more feedback from the steering. That's actually cool. You could also set an individual mode. For example, if you say suspension soft, but then more feedback from the steering, that would be my tip for today for an individual driving mode, actually. The normal air suspension is a little bit stiffer here. The curved mode in the e-active body control would now lean into the corners, but it's such an expensive option. And in the normal driving behavior, I think a normal air suspension setup is cooler, actually, because it's a little bit softer then. So I would stick either base suspension, go lower budget, or then go with the normal air suspension. I feel it's also good control here in the steering. When I'm in the corners, don't have to head of steer that much. That's fine. Also when I, for example, accelerate out of a corner, then you have the rear wheel bias, even if you have the all-wheel drive. That's also good that you can have some fun actually getting out of the corners right here. So we felt at home on the motorway. In the city, it's not too big. And here also, it's agile enough. It does give you driving fun. The only thing is here, when you have the slick surface with the seats, they don't offer too much side support. You get used to it, it's okay, but that could be maybe a little bit better. Other than that, it also very well handles this discipline here. The fuel economy, if you have some steady driving, mainly motorway, like 60 miles an hour, one kilometers an hour, you can indeed score some good figures of nine liters or more kilometers, 26 mbg US, 31 mbg UK. Of course, more going up in the mountain, then it's a little bit worse. And in the US, it will always be a little bit more efficient, like here at this moment. In Europe, you can calculate with a little bit higher consumption because of the OPF, the particle filter for also for the petrol engine, for example. Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge. Now with the 53, the GLE 53, also as the coupe, I'll put to the Sports Plus mode and let's accelerate it out. Whoa, that was like already 40 miles an hour. And I even didn't like, that was like 80% of the pedal. Really nice and how smooth you see in the steering wheel. It was like an acceleration out of the corner from standstill. Really nicely done. So a very, very controlled acceleration, rear wheel bias, of course, with this all-wheel drive system here. So you always get out of the corners very well. Difference is you have the same base engine, so to speak, but here with more horsepower tune, 435 horsepower. And with the facelift, with the electrification, this vehicle profits from it because it has even more power or even more boost. So the 450 at 5.6 seconds, then this one here was at 5.3, but now with the facelift at 5 seconds. So there's now a 0.6 second difference in the acceleration figure, 450 to the 53 model. So just more boost, more punch then, and also you heard it, just more sound. Of course, the exhaust is different and also in the sound emulation on the interior even more so. You just hear more something also this blop 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 when you get off the throttle. The air suspension is here also set on a stiffer note and for the 53 is an option. Standard for the 63 you can also get the anti-tilt control so the car just stays more upright. So indeed this one feels way better here in tighter corners. So you, don't, you, have, you feel as there would be less g-force applied. The seats also hold you tight a little bit more. They have also some microfiber share. Same goes for the steering wheel with microfiber share, which gives me just more control over the vehicle. So here, definitely the recipe, the more <laughs> microfiber you can get, the better it is for the sporty driving. And indeed, I have more fun driving this one here than the 450 in the corners. Of course, there's also a hefty extra price. 
but it just gives you more sporty feeling being here in this full-size SUV. At least for European taste, it's a full, <laughs> it's, it's a full-size SUV. So this is here, or these are the roads where the GLE 53 can really play out its advantages. Do we need the V8 for the 63? Not necessarily. This engine has way you know, more than enough power-wise, and the 53 is to me also a sweet spot. Remember that in the US you can only get the coupe as 53 or 63. So when you're from the US or North American market, this one would be then the coupe to go for actually. He also once again out of the corners, really nice, good control of the steering, very natural, and I don't have to steer too much. So having a lot of fun in these corners than here. So this is just a sporty difference and together with the different styling, visualization, also here with the carbon fiber and so on, it feels quite different to the normal GLS 450 indeed. It's just a question, do you desire this sporty driving feeling or would you rather say like, ah, you know, I'm buying the GLS more for the relaxed comfort and so on. Then of course, you might as well just stick with the 450. Both, of course, do a good job overall. Let's take a look at the updated Audi Q8, because recently Mercedes GLE and BMW X5 have been updated. Can Audi say something about this? What have they done? Let's take a look with Thomas Nautikfühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go here with an upgraded front grille. When you have the S-Line, you have these L forms here in the front grille. Everything with more black design, especially if you have the optional black package, which this vehicle is also equipped with. The standard front grille would have more vertical fins on the inside. Then here the two-dimensional Audi rings. Audi goes for this new CI corporate identity, basically. Zakir Gold is this new color also. Zakir, this desert around the Bahrain racetrack. And yeah, this was the most fitting shirt I could find for you today. Updated headlamps also. So the logic here is normal LED, then matrix LED, an optional, optional, HD matrix LED with laser lights. And the leather ones you all can see here. And even in the front, you can already pick different light designs to individualize your vehicle. Towards the side profile, here the length has been unchanged, 4 meters 99 or 196 inches. The Q8, as I said, typical competitor of the X5 or the GLE. Wheels now start already at 20 inch, up to 23 inch. These here are 22 inch wheels, so not the biggest ones, not the smallest one. Let's see how the riding comfort is. In the s here also painted wheel arches, so in the vehicle color, the base version would come still with the contrasting wheel arches. In the black pack, you also have the black mirrors here. Technology-wise, already the standard suspension is an adaptive suspension, so an adaptive steel suspension, optional. Also, this vehicle is equipped with it, the adaptive air suspension. Of course, then you have a wider span between comfort and sportiness. And you also get a rear axle steering, then the rear wheels turn up to five degrees in the opposite direction than the front wheels. The SQ8 would also offer an anti-tilt control and the sports differential at the rear. New tail lamp design and also OLEDs here in this lower part. Have you seen that? These are the proximity sensors in our studio shots where it was a little bit darker. You can even better see that, how it reacts. And even then in the rear, you can once again pick the individual light signature as design. I think it's a cool idea. Yeah, but then again, it's always an option. So the base vehicle won't have that. But the base vehicles will have this top update here also and also this you know this light strip that goes all the way across. Once again two-dimensional Audi rings and then in the lower part the contrast the Q8 logo here. This one means that is the S line and the SQ8 would just have the added S then. So what do you think? Do you like the outgoing model better or do you like this refresh? And who would have thought that lights one day become a buying or purchase argument for individual brands Audi wants to stress like, hey, we are the king of lighting. And that's why they also play once again here with these cascading turning indicators, at least in the highest trims. And even fancier, it is actually here in the front. Look at that with this segmented cascading and a massive success for the Audi Gefühl fake exhaust police. Thank you so much in the name of the Audi Gefühl fake exhaust police for supporting it for all these years, because now Audi have switched away from fake exhaust 
two real exhaust tips once again. <laughs> Since you also always ask about our locations where we film, today we are really lucky to film outside of Cape Town, so best greetings especially to our South African viewers today. And behind me is so-called Camps Bay, I think this beautiful beach here, so yeah, very fitting to our vehicle color today also. This is the car key here, slim and light, we know that. And look at here, the B pillar, they have the model naming here now, not to have too many badges on the exterior, so the days of over badging on the exterior is obviously gone. Then frameless doors with dual insulation. No. There we go, door closing sound. So you see here, it needs more push actually because of the good insulation here. And then it sounds really awesome. That's really rare that a frameless door sounds great. Inside of the door here with microfiber inserts. And I like this galvanization tip here for the window levers. And even they have a clicking sound here when you open or close them. Yeah, these deals are real love. S-line badge you can already see then in the lower part. So we also have S-line interior as well as on the steering wheel, perforation at the side. And these seats here are the best ones you can get actually for the Q8 with the microfiber, also with this you know, special structure on the inside. These are the normal sport seats and I would definitely go for them. But they're still lagging behind, especially in comparison to BMW, who is offering better materials. They're more sustainable, more animal friendly, and also better in the whole feeling and so on. But these ones are actually then uh, the best. And seating comfort here with 189 or six for two. A lot of headroom left. This is the one without panoramic roof. You can also get one. And you have good, get, good ergonomics, full size SUV position. Yeah, really feeling it, definitely. Interior cockpit overview. The refreshing thing about this update is that it is not all new because classic user interface here with the volume control, the steering wheel, then also physical controls to control the digital instruments. There we have some news. For example, when I hit the turning indicator, we have this nicer visualization on the inside now. And then we have this split screen. This is the top infotainment screen and the lower part is for the climate unit. Yes, I do always prefer physical climate dials, but for a digital solution here, it is fairly easy to use. I don't quite get this new menu tile in the software. This looks to me confusing. This here is very obvious. And then you have just, for example, the car features, or you go back to the home menu and here the Apple CarPlay integration, wired or wireless, and the same goes for Android Auto. An optional Bang & Olufsen sound system. Yeah, I think good sound quality. Not the most super spectacular ever, but actually very decent. In the middle console, I really like this large shifting lever, pretty cool. And here, adaptive cup holders, very good build quality. And also here, the middle console, which is cover, leather red, and then you fold it up and down like this. And here, you have space then for the smartphone connection, now all in USB-C. Well, I did find an issue here with the middle console. Look at that, this large thing here underneath. It is there that it has this, um, you know, this effect that you can also uh, fold this whole thing up and down a little bit and slide it forward at the same time. But the problem is it's so large down there. When you have your smartphone here in the inductive charging pad, it does overheat because it has no cooling. Then you say, ah, you know, I want to connect it with the cable. And then you connect it like this, for example. And then you have to say like, okay, where is the exact space for my smartphone? Like this maybe, and then how does it fit when it's you know, modern large smartphone? And when you then would put it down, you would smash your smartphone or then stuff like this happens. Yeah. No, I'm not farting. It's that the seat is just too close to the middle console and it's squeaking. So either put it far away or add some fabric here on the outside. Rear doors also frameless and then you have this electric shade you can put up and down just by pressing the window lever one more time. This doesn't go down further, but here I think it's a very nice and elegant solution. When I sit behind the driver's seat when I'm driving, I still have enough legroom left. This platform is pretty cool and then you can adjust the seating angle like here when you pull this lever. This is also the way you fold it completely down for the trunk. And you can also vary the trunk length like this if you want more trunk length or here if you want the most legroom. Even in the middle part, you can sit very well. In comparison to the Q7, it's not too big of a compromise. Of course, the Q7 has a little bit more trunk space and so on. Um, yeah, and then possible seven-seater. And here in the middle part, you have a nice climate unit also for the rear. Uh, it is somewhat with capacitive BS, but then again, you also ha have at least some 
clicking sounds. Let's take a look at the trunk measurements, electric hatch, and then we have a good meter or 40 inches in width and even a little bit more than a meter or 40 inches in length. Here, you can see I already fold one part. You can also split individually, but you have to do it from the rear. You cannot unfold them here. The only thing you can do is actually lower it for better loading in and out when you have the air suspension. And in the front part here, you have another small hole, for example, but yeah, you could also have a replacement tire there if you like. As for engines, in Europe you still get the 3.0-liter V6 diesel. This one here, worldwide the most important engine, the 3.0-liter V6 turbo petrol engine, 55 TFSI, 340 horsepower, 5.6 seconds is the acceleration figure. Standard quattro overdrive, that means an overdrive with a rear wheel bias. If you want it even quicker, then there would be the SQ8 with 4.1 seconds in the acceleration finger. figure from the acceleration figure, <laughs> and that is then from this 4-liter V8. Acceleration. <laughs> Plop, that's about 0 to 80 kilometers an hour. Pretty quick, felt nice, also rear biased <laughs> acceleration <laughs> from the overdrive. The Lia meter was also active, thank you for that. <laughs> There is always really good to um, give you a sense of speed, especially if you do not feel the G-forces over the video. So here in the dynamic mode, the air suspension is also set a little bit stiffer and have more feedback from the road. And here when the road is very even, that's pretty cool. And we have beautiful roads here with a nice view. The thing is when the air suspension is stiff here, in dynamic mode, and you have the 22-inch wheels mounted, yes, it feels cool and sporty. However, it is then also not the most comfortable experience when you're driving over some bumps. So that always depends then on the road condition. As I said, here is absolutely fine, you know, when it's not destroyed or something. But I feel this setup here, and especially with the bigger wheels, you do lose comfort. So you have to be aware of that. So it is definitely an SUV that does have this sporty focus here. Really nice reaction from the steering wheel here no dead zone, whatever. So I have a very fine feeling for the car. I like that. So it feels very, very well balanced. The rear axle steering helps me when we're driving slower speeds and so on. And also not feeling artificial at all. Very good here also when I'm doing some slalom left and right. Once again, the balance and the feeling for the car, that is what is very, very good. Then assistance systems here on this countryside road, which is even more crucial because can this vehicle here keep the lane even if it's more in this bend? Here so far, pretty smooth. Now on the right side, I always keep the control of the vehicle. Ah, see here, this one car didn't get. Maybe it's also because one line is yellow, one line is white or something. So yeah, never trust 100% in it. And mainly it's used for autobahn purposes, but I like to try it also here on countryside lanes because the very, very good systems also do that then in this case here. It is a good system, yes, but you see at some point it also has its limits. When you, by the way, want to switch back again here, for example, you can click in the lower part, not the best selection here to pick the driving modes or then here like this, click on the screen, yeah. Then here you can go to the comfort mode, in the comfort mode then some more softness from the suspension then and also the steering becomes a little bit lighter overall. So this is probably the everyday setting, I would say. It still feels sporty and I would definitely set the suspension to comfort because otherwise it just gets too, too rough in the bumpy sections and so on. So to me the cool thing is always that although it's a large and heavy SUV, because of the great balance it always feels somewhat lighter and easier to control basically. Here we know at really slow speeds I feel more from the rear axle steering, but considering it is in rear axle steering it feels very natural how it reacts and so on. So I've always loved the driving feeling of the Q8 and the updated version here makes no difference to that actually. Yeah, for me it's always pretty strange of course here with the left hand drive traffic and in a way even stranger to drive left hand steering wheel with left hand traffic. Usually you have the other one here like the right hand steering with the left hand traffic and, and vice versa and so on but I mean yeah. After all you get used to that <laughs> it's all adding up to the experience. 
changing the temperature by the way here while driving is not too bad so as I said earlier although it's digital you can do it actually quite well also while driving although a physical control always needs no looking at all brake feeling also really nice so you know exactly what you're doing at any time or when you want to control the volume and so on I like this classic user interface of the vehicle you can also use the shifting pedals here to shift down yourself for example, for engine brake, when you're going down here for a longer period of time, or if you want some more RPM, and then you can directly accelerate it out. Yeah, sound-wise, I have to say, rather step downwards, but you know, with these new days particle filters, which are also great to keep the particles in, sound has been decreased. Again, for the US versions, this will then be a little bit different. So if I could suggest something, I think, although it has air suspension sometimes in potholes too rough so what can you do against it i mean even if you're in a comfort mode here the only thing you would actually do is pick smaller wheels not even the biggest one on this one here but i think 20 or 21 inch 21 inches maybe then the best compromise that you have some cool look still but you just have a little bit more driving comfort. So my driving impressions here from Chapman's Peak Drive. If you are in the Cape Town area at some point, you should take this road, one of the most beautiful roads in the world, definitely. And here it's more about enjoying the scenic views and the view outside the vehicle, from the inside to the outside, is actually pretty decent. So I have a good feeling of where the car is ending at every side and that's not the same with all new vehicles that you exactly know, have a feeling for the dimensions, but even if you look to the rear there and so on or to the back mirror, there's no problem at all and that also shows that the Q8 among these, this like almost SUV coupe segment, the X6 would of course also be a competitor or the GLE coupe, the Q8 sits somewhat in between I would say, but these true coupe silhouette SUVs they have less overview than when you're sitting on the inside but that's actually fine here with the Q8. Here also when the bends are a little bit tighter rear axle steering is helping me. It's also by the way a factor for parking in and out. Maybe you've heard that just like there was a bump in the road that's what I meant you know when I have an air suspension I just want a little bit more comfort out of the vehicle um, yeah but that's the only thing I can really criticize here. Yeah, and probably also the fuel economy, so we will drive it a longer period of time. But it really seems to be that, um, although it's mild hybrid system here now for the six cylinders, the eight cylinder does not have that. And although the, you know, like, it's not like the most fuel consuming engine of all time. And I know this engine for a very long time, but here, obviously, also when the AC has to work a lot, um, the consumption seems to go quite high, and we'll put it in the video description and in the in, uh, and in the comment below in the pinned comment and then tell you more about that by the way instead of choosing the driving modes which sometimes can be complicated you can just always pull the shifting lever here to the s shifting mode then you have a nicer acceleration immediately that's actually pretty cool and it's also an easy and quick way to you know be a little bit more spontaneous with it and always pull back also the sound feedback it gives you, right? And of course also clicking sounds and so on. Yeah, that brings me back to one of the crucial points that the user interface is still really good and you know exactly always what you are doing. A full driving review of the new Porsche Cayenne. Is it all new and all new generation? Is it a excellent facelift? Something in between? We'll find out with Thomas and Autogofu in 4K full screen, full length. Let's go here with the new front design. And indeed, they changed the whole front hood. These parts here, more horizontal stress in the design and new HD matrix headlamps. They're also mounted here. Of course, an option. And you have these daytime running light design in the top part, but another one here in the lower part. But here, you can see this is not just the upper one, the lower one is fixed. And this new blue color, also new now, called Montego Blue, it's pretty fancy and has this kind of this greenish nuance. Turning indicators in the front, pretty cool here in the lower part where it replaces the daytime running light. The length, 4 meters 92 or 194 inches. This has remained the same. However, wheels now start at 20 inch and up to 22 inch wheels. Here, the biggest ones available. We see it here on display. And here, 
vehicle color also at the wheel arch and this lower part you can either get in the black contrast but also in vehicle color if you prefer that rear axle steering is optionally available then the rear wheels turn in the opposite direction than the front wheels and suspension wise they have reworked both suspension the base suspension and also the optional air suspension giving you more comfort and sportiness at the same time is that true we'll find out soon in driving in the rear, new styling element that the light strip goes all the way across. That's beautiful. And also the three-dimensional Porsche lettering. That's pretty cool. And you might have seen that here, the lower area, the number plate is now here in the lower part, also in the SUV. So this is now very similar to the Coupe version of the Cayenne. Both are, of course, still available. And now the rear looks, you know, more or less alike. Here you can see with these black tips, these are the optional sports exhaust for that six cylinder. Turning indicators in the rear around the three dimensional light strip. Let's now compare the Cayenne S and the Cayenne Coupe. We can see here this second horizontal element is missing at this vehicle. That's why it has the sport design package. Then you have this wider hole here. And indeed, it looks like something would be missing here. So I prefer the base version look there. This unique color here, by the way, is called Geysa Gray. But I think it neither has to do something with Geysa nor with Gray. What's your take on that? This very vehicle is also equipped with the optional lightweight sports package. And that means you have these special 22 inch wheels and even optional on top the PCCB the Porsche ceramic composite brake and you can now also get them for example with, with black brake calipers before it was only the yellow ones but that way it also works looks pretty fancy indeed here by the way you can see these are the wheel arches that are not in vehicle color so you can then pick the styling you want this is an optional sticker you get here with the, some kind of retro look and said we have the coupe here and that has this falling roof line right here stronger shoulder formation and when you look above another part of this lightweight sports package is the carbon fiber roof yeah that brings the center of gravity a little bit lower but does it really matter in driving not really and in the rear you can see that lower graphic SUV and Coupe are kind of similar now. Just this upper part there, you can see, of course, this flatter window right here. And the Cayenne S is now once again a V8. You can see it also here in the different exhaust pipes. I would say let's do a sound comparison V6 versus V8. <laughs> So which one did you like better, the 3 liter V6 or here the 4 liter V8? Tell me in the comments. If you wonder, by the way, hey, wait a minute, the 6 cylinder sounded better. Might be a reason because the 6 cylinder has the Sport exhaust and this one here is the base exhaust for the V8. Engine lineup all have received more power. The main engine, the 3 liter V6 for the base KN, now with around 350 horsepower, six or 5.7 seconds then with a sports chrono package is the acceleration figure to one kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. A second quicker is the KN S, which now again receives the V8 with around 470 horsepower. Based on that, even more 660 horsepower for the KN Turbo GT, the strongest pure combustion engine model. Hybrids, either based on this one, the normal Cayenne hybrid, or then also future, even stronger hybrids. They are coming up very soon. We'll keep you updated. And should you wonder, what about the GTS? Yes, also coming up again. You'll see a review on how to go fuel in 2024. This is the key fob. Yeah, always with this 911 silhouette. Really beautiful. This is here for the independent heating, if you have that option. Then door closing sound really solid i love that and of course you can also get a soft close when you want to go for that option then inside of the doors also once again with the horizontal stress really good build quality indeed then for the interior you can get different stylings here for example we have a bright styling this all animal skin alternatives would be race tex microfiber on the inside or a sport tex in the special sports lightweight package a fabric then with this retro look so you have some possibilities but not too much so they didn't change anything there with the facelift that is to me um, one of two disappointing things the 
second disappointing thing will come very soon. Headroom here, no problem at all, although this is the one with the panoramic roof, so with 189 and 602, no problem. It's a very good and upright seating position. Ergonomics also nice, GT steering wheel here, and soon I'm going to show you the all new cockpit. Here you can adjust it electronically. New interior layout, straight focus still, that's what I like, really clean, and then Taycan instruments and here the 911 steering wheel in this case the GT steering wheel you can see it here with the screws so a mix of Taycan and 911 now in the interior and you have the central screen updated and optional also a passenger screen and in front of these two ducks hounds <laughs> which is German Dackel by the way listen and repeat Dackel we show you the head-up display which you can also adjust from this view to a more racy look or than the simplistic view Digital instruments are adjustable. Here, for example, the middle part, assistance systems view, very impressive GPS view, wow. Austrian mountains, or also full screen. And then this is the night vision. And you can also switch to the right side, what you want to have there, and click through further to the left side. But sometimes you are not quite sure where you are at the moment in adjustment, so it's not that intuitive. However, I really love that we have real buttons at the steering wheel here, a volume jog, or also here for the voice input, so something to press. And the physical drive mode selector at the steering wheel. The shifting lever is now here, like in the Taycan, drive or reverse. It has this metal knurling brown shaver atmosphere. Um, yeah, it is somewhat practical, but of course not really that sporty, you know what I mean? And of course, how can we miss that? The stopwatch. Middle console, slide this one open, charging via cable, USB-C or inductive charging. And then I really appreciate to still have a manual climate unit and with nice clicking sounds as well. Then we have here a cup holder, so you can also slide it forward or open it for more space. And if you wonder about fingerprints and scratches here in middle console, yes, definitely a problem. New infotainment system, you have either this home screen or this one, this has this yeah, this app view, I would say, and everything has been reworked. This is the car internal GPS, which is well usable indeed. And of course, you'll have the Apple CarPlay or the Android Auto integration looks like this. And the Bowmaster sound system, 6,000 euro extra, is actually pretty cool. Has like a true sound, so not too bass intensive indeed, and not too much surroundish. And here, you can see when I switch the driving modes at the steering wheel, they also appear here and then you can also set everything in the screen. The passenger screen cannot be seen from the left, only when you are at the passenger seat, then you can actually see it. And for example, for following GPS, but also the instruments of the drivers, G-Force, yeah, very important in the Cayenne. Um, and also video streaming is possible depending on the installed apps, they will offer more and more there. The panoramic roof, you can open this slider here, and this is also still one you can really open completely. Here, double action slider plus, and well, it goes really wide like this, and then you can also move the slider totally to the rear. The slider here now via touch, and the middle part for the glass roof is still with physical feedback. Rear seating area in the Cayenne SUV, really upright these rear seats you can see that already and that also delivers you a good seating comfort you have enough leg room here also for tall persons when other tall persons are driving and rear headroom here to the side is you know, kind of shallow in the coupe they lower the bench a little bit that the headroom is still guaranteed and here you can adjust the back part of the seat that is of course a cool feature and also when you want to have more trunk you slide forward here in a two-third one-third split the middle seat Let's check it out. You can sit here. It's actually quite good for a three-seater in the rear. This massive middle tunnel here, but you can actually easily get along with five tall adults. And in the middle part, you have a nice console. And I really appreciate that it's not all just touch, but you also have here these nice knurled clicking buttons for the temperature control. Big microphone for you today, by the way, so you don't hear background noise. Then here, let's check out the trunk or the boot area. And the width is about a meter or 40 inches, a little bit longer, and also the standard length is a meter or 40 inches. And you can see you can fold the seats, but you have to go around and then two-third, one-third split. 
and the maximum height 78 centimeters which is around 30 centimeters actually well, very well usable here for a sports SUV. The coupe version of course is always a little bit limited here in this back area but it's not a large compromise. Second interior first of all a situation in neodyme so this I would say slightly golden look looks pretty fancy doesn't it and this is also the KNS with a lightweight sports package that means we have the sports seats with the retro fabric on the inside I think it looks pretty special definitely reminding us of a retro 911 and also because the fabric surface is just softer you have more comfort in these seats actually and also the side support helps while driving especially like slalom and so on so this whole interior then feels a little more racy this is by the way also a manual adjustment of the steering wheel however make no mistake this vehicle here has even more cost intensive options than the other interior but overall pretty cool and here we also feature an Alcantara steering wheel for even more grip so this setup here overall is pretty cool I would go for this one here special thing about the armrest look at that it so easily goes forward and backward in the European versions and also some other markets the US version by law requires a special safety mechanism that gets stuck and then you have to release it to press it forward and that's also better for the US version definitely because we had situations where we were approaching a traffic light and then imagine there's like a you know, hot coffee a paper a cup here in, in the cup holders and then you just have your arm here have a little bit of g-force forward and then this happens easily so um, the Porsche guys told me that this has not changed for the facelift here but I felt that it has never been that loose so to speak so yeah either get the US version then <laughs> it's no problem at all and other than that I told the Porsche guys that I think that it needs to be you know a little bit heavier in the movement rear seats of the Cayenne Coupe well we also have the lightweight sports package seats here the nice fabric and this is then the setup with the single seats so in the middle part we have no seating possibility but you can, can also get a through bench for the coupe and well we have no panoramic roof in this case and the roof is a little bit falling backwards so yeah it is a little bit limited in the headroom as for the coupe but not too much because at the same time they put the seat bench in the back part a little bit lower so the seating angle is a little bit different to me you sit more comfortable more upright in the normal SUV version but still it's totally fine here so this trade-off for the coupe look is to me totally okay and now we have to talk about floor mats look at that here the front floor mats they have this this knob and that way they are secured the floor mats here but the rear floor mats now see that they don't have that so the previous version had these clips in the rear floor mats and I was wondering now is this just cost savings and I asked the Porsche managers about that and they actually said no the reason behind it is that customers actually went to the Porsche dealer and then the Porsche dealers actually filed a report that a couple of times it happened that people tried to take out the floor mats and they were secured by the knob and then they were ripping the floor mat apart together with the floor underneath it really hmm and that is the reason why they changed it took out this secure mechanism here and now it's just loose in there but there's also like a slidable background of this one so um, sometimes we ended up going out of the vehicle and the floor mat was like like this all over the place basically so I don't know I mean first of all who would rip the whole floor apart with the floor mat I mean can't you take out the floor mat properly uh, and secondly if you change to this solution then then maybe at least make the background of the floor mat sticky or something right all right sport plus let's accelerate it out let's see Plop, that is already around 80 kilometers an hour wow pretty impressive and I was starting basically in the corner that's also what the KN is standing for it is an SUV but it feels like a sports car at the same time it is very well controllable all-wheel drive has a real world bias and all the engines have been upgraded as for the power here around 350 horsepower for the base Cayenne six-cylinder three-liter six-cylinder 
around six seconds is the acceleration figure, the official one to one kilometer an hour or six to miles an hour and yeah, kind of also reach that indeed. They have also worked on the suspension, both the base suspension and also the optional air suspension, which we have here. And they promise actually that it's sportier and more comfortable at the same time. And it also switches then according to the driving mode here, for example, sport or sport plus. It's a little bit stiffer. Also, it gets, goes lower at higher speeds, and I can also switch them back to, again to the normal mode. Then we have a little bit more comfort, but actually all the different modes are really fine. And indeed, I have to say, we also have big wheels mounted here today, but even if you run over some potholes and so on, it's not uncomfortable at all. You have this upright command driving position, and the suspension is really doing a good job. If you ask yourself base suspension or air suspension, of course the air suspension offers you more flexibility and variety from comf comfort to sportiness, but the base suspension will also do fine. So the problem with the Cayenne is that it easily gets too expensive with all the different options. At the end of this review, we'll also talk about the very concise price of this very vehicle. But indeed, I mean, the ride before pre-face lift was already superb but here even a notch more comfort and a notch more sportiness yes they have achieved that indeed and also noise insulation wise so silent in here at the moment around 70 kilometers an hour now going like 80 kilometers an hour it's like 50 miles an hour and it's super silent you don't hear any rolling noise no wind noise nothing at all so i really fine-tuned this vehicle and sometimes it is good when they don't do like an all new generation, but really fine tune an existing one. However, this extensive facelift here, what feeling do you get? Yes, it doesn't feel like a completely new vehicle, but it really feels even more refined. So if you have an existing Porsche Cayenne, I wouldn't necessarily say that it feels so different that you definitely need the newest one, you know, because the existing one is already fine. But when you step into the Cayenne world now, even a notch more, you know, smoothness, sportiness and comfort at the same time. If you like these digital instruments, like this full digitalization of the cockpit now, that is of course a matter of preference, you know. Everything is more digitalized now, but I'm happy that we still, for example, have the manual climate control seat in the center knob, uh, center control console. So while driving, I can still control that and also while driving to me it's really important that I can change the driving modes directly at the steering wheel. With so many new modern vehicles we are distracted picking something in the infotainment system while driving. At least for the driving mode this remains really really straightforward and simple. And what I also want to show you here the rear axle steering turning all the way in and for such a large SUV it really handles very well because the rear wheels go in the opposite direction than the front wheels and yeah, to get to speed again also so effortless indeed so i feel that this new cayenne and we can say new cayenne indeed is just smoother and one more time 50 to 100 stop that's it already and here you feel the good handling Yes, of course, you sit higher, but you hardly feel it's an SUV. Also good side support from the seat. And I really like the precise steering input. So hardly any other SUV gives you such a good handling balance feeling. And there's no dead zone area from the steering. And you exactly know what you're doing. You have a great feedback from the tires, from the road. That's also what you expect when you get a Porsche. For me, it would actually be the main reason. And the cool thing that you still have it in their big SUV. At the same time, when it's city time here, you go back to the normal driving mode. Suspension goes softer again. And you just relax and enjoy the comfort. The seats, by the way, from the material also, and the skin pretty stiff. So the seat ergonomics, what's underneath the seat is good. The top part. You have always more comfort when you go for the race text, the microfiber, or for the sport text, the fabric seat. So by that, you can not only do something for the animals, but also increase your seating comfort. And here, once again, also when you're in a normal driving mode and accelerate it out, 
when you pin it down, you also get the full power. <laughs> you, you can always watch your passengers going like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. You always have to watch out. Stuff happens like that. And now, guys, the V8 in the Cayenne S. Ooh. Whoa. Der hat aber ordentlich Druck, Alter. Would we say in German. <laughs> As in, that one has, you know, a lot of pressure, yo. <laughs> Der hat aber ordentlich Druck, Alter. Listen and repeat. <laughs> yeah, and this is like a second quicker in the acceleration figure to one kilometer or 62 miles an hour than the V6, the upgraded one. And of course, sound-wise, yeah, we had the Sport exhaust in the V6, which sounded nice indeed, but here you have a little bit more, I would say, raw sound, can you call it that way? And also some really nice winding corners here. Wow, although it's a heavy SUV, it gets out of the corner really quickly and super precise. Here, once again, the handling, the Alcantara steering is also helping me with that. And then the sport seat with the fabric, I don't slide on that so much. So this is an overall sportier setup we have here. Wow, so much fun. That is really the thing about this, this Cayenne. You can have so much driving, sporty driving fun, although it's a large and heavy SUV and it can also be comfortable at any time. You know, that's, that's the real cool thing. <laughs> Some other, yeah, we are also giving in the colleagues a nice shot here, passing by. Beautiful roads here also. This is so much fun. Also, it's not leaning into the corner at all. If you ask me V6 versus V8, yes, of course, sticking with the opinion that the V6 is enough. The V8 just delivers a little bit more raw sound experience. Yes, even a little bit quicker. Yeah, than the weight, I wouldn't say that you really feel the big weight difference or so, you know, that's that's not the thing. Of course, also price-wise, it goes higher, but you will also see at our final pricing result, the price of the can is really varying so much depending on the picked options. So which engine you go for is not the main thing. It's really about the individual options you pick. And here you have to say, when you go for the sportier seats, and the sport yeah, steering wheel, for example, that already makes a massive difference in driving. In driving modes here, same, I can also go to the normal mode. We have a little bit softer feedback, also once again here from the air suspension. Yeah, just the Alcantara steering wheel is so great. All the steering wheels are, by the way, pretty thin. I like that. Thomas B, cameraman, he more prefers a little bit, you know, a little bit thicker steering wheels, talked about that earlier, but I think it really helps you here in very precise driving and you know when you're passing some houses and so on normal driving mode keeping it also a little bit more silent when you're more than again on the open road you can go to a sportier mode and then accelerate it out wow so flawless overall and the s driving feeling is of course different here now with this v8 once again so goodbye for the 2.9 liter six cylinder by turbo that will not be here anymore. It won't come back. It ha is a combination, you know, like emission things and um, also the power you can get out of this one. So they decided to now once again go upsizing here with the V8 and yeah, fun wise, definitely nice. So one more good shots here for the other camera team. <laughs> Consumption wise, of course, the thing is that the eight cylinder will consume more fuel. So definitely have to calculate with that. The six cylinder is overall the more logical, more economic choice without compromising on fun. But of course, you've experienced it here. The V8 does deliver something special, no doubt. Pricing this very vehicle around 90,000 euros base price, but then 50,000 euros of extra. So 140K in total. And the price here for our Bentley uh, Cayenne S 67,000 euros of extra equipment, making a total price of 180,000 euros. So is it now all new or is it a facelift? 
is a very extensive facelift indeed and just the side doors they have remained the same most of the other things have been replaced indeed and they want to make it fit for the next years actually in 2025 we will present to you the all new electric cayenne and then these two the combustion and the electric cayenne will run parallel for a couple of years that's why they reworked it now so intensively a full driving review of the updated BMW X6 with Thomas Nautical in 4K full screen full length. Let's go here with the changed front double kidney. And actually, this is here with the vertical fins, the double kidney that the X6M had before. Now also here for the M Performance model, the M60i with the 8 cylinder in our test here today. The M Sport Pack with accentuations in the lower part is always standard for every X6 model now. Of course, and also the same here for the M Performance model. Changed headlamps with a new daytime running light in this arrow design. It's pretty interesting and you only see if, when it's on, when you come around here a little bit, when you look at it from the front, then you see that they're actually on at this moment. Also interesting that when you hit the turning indicators or the hazard lights, it has this pulsing effect that's a pretty cool thing also this color i think is a very interesting green it's called isle of man green so special m racing color the length at four meters 96 or 195 inches and this side silhouette with the falling roof line and the really strong hip area some are on team love some are on team hate about that which one are you on tell me in the comments wheels from 20 inch this is here 21 inch and optional even 22 inch wheels, but I think you shouldn't go too large because you lose riding comfort then. Talking about the riding comfort, as for the suspension, it's very interesting. You can get the normal adaptive suspension, which is already a little bit stiffer in the X6 because the M Sport Pack is standard. Then you can go for the professional M suspension and that one then is even stiffer. And you also get the rear axle differential lock, rear axle steering and an anti-tilt control or you can also go directly to an air suspension. That's also possible depending on how sporty the ride needs to be for you. The air suspension gives you the widest span between sportiness and comfort. Here, by the way, we have special mirror caps and carbon fiber. This is an option. They also have this special, you know, like aer aerodynamic M4. The rear axis steering, by the way, moves three to four degrees in the opposite direction than, than the front wheels, reducing the turning circle massively. Rear design here, very horizontally drawn tail lamps with a nice signature. Then there's a really fat M60 I batch in this very version. I like that the vehicle color is picked up in the lower part of the vehicle. However, here, <whistles> out of fuel fake exhaust police alert because the outer tips are fake. Here, this you know middle split, then the real exhaust on the inside. Yeah, they would be beauty enough, aren't they? Yeah? And in a time where turning indicators get smaller and smaller, this is definitely wide enough. Hmm, honestly, sound wise for the V8, here in Europe we have the OPF, that's the particle filter, then for the petrol engines. So the sound on the US models will be different. So I think in Europe, sound wise, it doesn't even make sense to go for the V8. In the US, it will sound still, you know, much more growling. Engines with the BMW X6, the 3 liter inline six cylinder diesel or petrol, or then this one here, M60i M Performance model, 4.4 liter V8, 530 horsepower, and 4.3 seconds is the acceleration figure. Above that, there's only the true X6M model, but it houses the same base engine. Yes, a little bit more horsepower a little bit quicker in the acceleration, but also like 50K difference in the pricing. So if you go, want to go V8, this is the more clever choice and you will already have more than enough performance. We'll show you all of that in the driving part. Plug-in hybrid, by the way, not available for the X6, only for the X5. Key fob always features the M colors because the M Sport Pack is standard for the X6, then door closing sound. Ah, that's really cool, very solid and look also here, the panel gap, build quality, everything really even inside of the doors. You have everything very slick and clean, also here with the contrast stitches and so on. The Hofmeister kink design also for the inside door handle, inspired by old BMW vehicles from the exterior part. Then of course the M steering wheel, here also with contrast stitching. 
really colorful, but I like we still have real buttons on the steering wheel. But the new cockpit, that is something really different. Command driving position like you have in a large SUV. However, these here are the M Sport seats and they are stiffer as for the bolstering and also feel a little bit sportier overall. So I recommend either to stick with the normal sport seats or for the best comfort, pick the comfort seats. They're a little bit wider and softer. And the normal sport and comfort seat also offer the sensor fin high grade leather red with the softest bolstering. Here the M sport seat only available in animal skin. Interior cockpit overview with huge changes. Here you now have this curved screen, one unit, two screens separately of course and 12.3 inch 14.9 inch and the climate unit inside the screen always stays at this very level then the climate knobs here are gone to me that's a downside you still can control the vents here manual and has a nice clicking sound and new ambient lighting here i put it also in green you can change the colors in this case because it's the m performance model you also have the m batch otherwise it would say X610 in base models. Digital instruments come to life when you start up the vehicle like this and then oh there's the eight cylinder and they all have mild hybrid technology now by the way these engines so that's a face up to there for you also see this battery symbol that you can also gain back some energy via regenerative braking and here the content you can um, have different contents in here for example also the map from the apple carplay for example that's also possible three important things to consider for this middle console unit a don't pick the high gloss black because it collects fingerprints and scratches and so on but there are different decors available second thing I'll slide this open adaptive cup holders oh cooled and heated that's nice but then here the inductive charging pad for the phone don't use it your phone does overheat and they do not implement a cooling function also not in the face lift here just use the cable charger and then put your phone on the cable then third thing this is this option for the crystalline look here for the shifting lever and also here inside of the turning and pressing knob this is blinding you it looks maybe fancy but just go for the standard option but by the way you can see here this is now integrated really slim and small before you had the real shifting lever it is pro and con it looks cleaner but it feels less sporty. News also as for the software, BMW OS 8.5. It cannot be retrofitted for OS 8.0 models because there's also more hardware underneath for that. And you have this home screen with the CarPlay maps. And here on the left side, you can also easily access again the consumption data, for example. This is a good thing because so far it was really hidden deep in the menu and there are still like so many functions left. So they created this new home screen to make it easier steering wheel and heated seats are by the way accessed right here yeah to me it's also a little bit too complicated that's the only down step with this upgrade rear seats yeah it's kind of like a black hole than here in this very trim nice alcantara black headliner though that's uh, that's actually quite fancy legroom this is the catch of this vehicle you hardly have any legroom considering the length However, here from the height, also when you're tall, you can sit here in the rear. That's no problem at all. But I find cool that I still have a manual climate unit here then for the rear seats. As for the trunk, this is of course somewhat a compromise here with an SUV coupe because that area here is lower. Then you have this folding mechanism for this cover, 580 liters, about a meter or 40 inches in length, but 110 or 45 inches in width. And the height here, it's actually fine you can also reach over then here to hold the seats from here that's possible and again just this height in the very front part this is the limitation with like 45 centimeters or 18 inches all right let's go plop that's 100 kilometers an hour 60 miles an hour yeah that about this V8 M60i. <laughs> you can scream, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she tried to hold back a little bit. Yeah, that was pretty powerful. Of course, all-wheel drive with rear axle bias. Yeah, it's 530 horsepower playing all the effect right there. Whew. Yeah, that is giving you the goosebumps or the adrenaline. And here now, adaptive suspension sportier note here with the m suspension professional even stiffer actually then anti-tilt control that means the car is always keeping it upright 
rear axle steering. We also have in this one rather plays an effect on lower speeds so to reduce the turning circle and so on. Wow, this doesn't feel like driving an SUV actually. And whereas the X5, especially in standard trims, doesn't come close like to the sportiness of a Porsche Cayenne, here in the M60i trim and also with the stiffer suspension, yeah, this is matching the Porsche Cayenne in the sportiness or at least coming close. So you can definitely compare these here you know, in the corner. Also really good as for the steering feel, very precise how you steer in the vehicle. You know what the vehicle is doing. And I'm really happy with the steering feel in the X5 and in the X6 as well. Yeah, there you hear the V8 definitely even louder than in the US versions without that petrol engine particle filter. Whew, wow. I mean, in, in tight corners, you still feel the weight, yes. In the low seating sedan sports car or something will be sport here in the corners because of the center of gravity. But still, considering for an SUV, this is yeah, as good as it gets. And I'm not really sure if the true M version would deliver you so much more driving fun. It is just stiffer, you know, and of course way more expensive. So if you ask me, this is totally fine here. And I think the M60i is also the better everyday vehicle because although you have the stiffer setup here in the M suspension, it still feels really nice to drive. Um, also, no, I was checking if it's an animal or just a leaf on the, on the road. Also, I think the adaptive suspension is totally fine if you compare it to a possible air suspension in this vehicle, because here you have the compromise between sportiness and comfort. And even though we have 21 inch wheels, okay, the road is actually quite good here also. We're driving around you know, Bavarian towns here at this moment, and of course, it was outside. We have to see how it gets when it's a little bit bumpier, but wow, what a driving experience. Very cool, sporty driving here really enjoying that. Wow. Yeah, so difference X5, X6 is more about really what suspension you pick. So you can configure both in an equal way. You know, that the one is a little bit cut off in the back doesn't make such a difference. It's more than do you have an M Sport pack for an X5? Do you go for the adaptive M suspension professional or do you pick an air suspension so you can really vary that according to the suspension picks you are doing. Then here in the city, for example, you can always go back to the comfort mode. Everything is relaxed then and so on. D shifting mode, you can go back to that as well. In the S shifting mode, by the way, just pull the shifting lever once. S shifting mode always gives you more RPM, shifts up later, shifts down earlier. So this is separated, you know, so you can pick comfort or sport mode that rather does like suspension and already does something to the transmission, but then even more stress on a different shifting level when you hit this shifting lever and pull it backwards. So let me just show that you do once again, comfort mode to sport mode, all a little bit more RPM and S mode. You hear it's already a gear lower from that. So you can really vary that. And of course also go to an individual mode, for example. It's also important then from the sound from the outside because maybe sometimes you have situations where you think like, ah, it doesn't need to be that loud when you're close to the neighbors or something. Maybe other situations where you think like, hey, I don't care, make it as loud as possible. Heard that sound? That was here the sign for the stop sign. So an additional acoustic warning that you should come to a halt at the stop sign. Maybe good when you sometimes miss a stop sign or something. Um, yeah, and of course there's a really high fine for not like coming to a total standstill on the stop sign. If you are here in the comfort mode, by the way, don't hear so much from the engine, but of course at the same time you can always go for the pin through and then you also have all the power you, have, you need. So this is always possible and maybe also some situations where you get on an autobahn and you need the sudden push. Talking about German autobahn, motorway with even higher speed, Right, sport mode, as shifting mode, and German Autobahn from 120 kilometers an hour, so like 70 miles an hour. Let's go. Oh, that's 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. We can go even even faster. Yeah, 
I mean, the windows picking up, but in general, I mean, how calm and silent this, this car is remaining. Wow, really impressive. Of course, you're not hitting the brakes, but they are also working very well. Good feeling also for the brakes, indeed. In general, I mean, like here at the normal motorway speed and non-German uh, thinking, like 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, you hardly hear any wind noises at all. So it's really silent and this is also the other side of this vehicle. Yes, you can go attack and so on, but when you go comfort mode and normal shifting mode, then it's as silent and comfortable, just like a normal X6 or X5. And for also in the SUV segment, comparing to the competition, it's very silent, calm and collected. You feel it is a very good premium product indeed. And X5 and X6 both are among my favorites in this large SUV segments because this compromise, you know, like you, you can you can go really relaxed, long way, long mileage, especially if you pick the comfort seats with the new sensor fin. These seats you definitely also feel while driving. They are less comfortable because they're just stiffer. Um, so either normal sports or the best choice than normal the comfort seats with the new sensor fin. That's the best combination for best comfort actually. Also, I feel that the, these seats are a little bit lower, so the steering wheel is then a little bit off as for the height. So I drive these seats elevated a little bit. And I don't do that with the combat seats, actually. Yeah, but then with the press of a button or press of a throttle, it becomes almost a sports car. And it doesn't feel like it would be shaking up at all being an SUV. You know, 140 kilometers an hour, it's like 90 miles an hour. Changing the lane, changing back again, feels so good, calm and collected. Yeah, I mean this Adaptive M Suspension Professional is definitely helping here too, to make it even sportier. Yeah, I was, I was surprised that it doesn't feel too stiff, you know. Sometimes when I have the M Sports setups in the BMWs, it feels too stiff, but here in the X6, it's actually, actually totally fine. Now at only like 170, 180 kilometers an hour, then the wind noises are picking up. But it's actually also fine, you know, so I can't expect more, more from that. Look at that, how calm and collected the car remains at this high speed. You hardly feel the speed at all. Really nice. Even at these speeds, of course, you can activate the assistance systems. The assisted driving you with the active lane keeping assist also works at that speed. Maybe it's not necessarily meant to do it um, for that but yeah, also keeping the distance to the car in front of us for example and then here once again also accelerating again here in the slight bend the lane is being kept and let me also show you the automated lane change here we go just tipping it and then the vehicle does it on its own just didn't work at super high speeds so they have a speed limit for that that was within 140 kilometers an hour, still worked. Let's see, 160. Yeah, still doing it at 160 kilometers an hour, wow. That's impressive. So, of course, most fun is when you do it yourself and also using the turning indicator yourself, for example, really like putting it in, that is so much fun. So not tipping it, but really like, bang, putting it back again, that's really cool has so much good haptic feeling for that. I like to do that here once again. Wow, what an Autobahn SUV we have here. And yeah, one thing you, by the way, feel the new mild hybrid system is, not on the Autobahn, but when you're driving really slowly, for example, and then there are some electric moments actually where the engine shuts off and you roll basically, like when you're parking in and out, there this mild hybrid system can play a role. Other than that, minimum consumption when you're not doing things like this, like 11 liters on one kilometers, 20 mbg US, 25 mbg UK. So it's like 5 mbg less or 2 liters more definitely in comparison to the six cylinders. So the eight cylinder will consume more fuel definitely. And of course, when you do more high speed driving like this here, yeah, then it gets definitely worse. Here we are at the moment at 14 liters on one kilometer. So that these are figures less than 20 mpg, of course. So um, yeah, always depends on how you drive. A review that you requested is the all new Range Rover 
Sport. Here was Thomas an autogefühl for you in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go with the front that has this new fluent, seamless design for better wind efficiency, but also for this modern approach. The lamps here with a very slim daytime running light, very well integrated as well. This dark blue north color here, very beautiful today with the copper accentuations. This is a top trim autobiography and there's news to come also in the interior. The questions are for today. Can they transport the Range Rover Sport into the modern era? Are they also challenging the German competitors like Mercedes, Audi, BMW? And also, how does it compare to the Range Rover versus Range Rover Sport? All of these questions right now. I think from the design here in the front, it is evolutionary, yes, but still more modern with this very fluent approach. I think a very impressive look in the front. What do you think? Internal indicators here look quite cool. They do not replace the lower part, but they appear here in the higher part. Very slim integration, but very, very visible. 4 meters 95 or 195 inches is the length of the Range Rover Sport. Now, what is the difference to the Range Rover? Wheelbase is actually the same. Astonishing, right? Has been the same also in the previous generation. To the short wheelbase Range Rover. So the big difference is, in the Range Rover, there's also a long wheelbase version available, which is not available here for the Range Rover Sport. And also from the roofline, from design, this one here has a sportier rear roofline, just for this little bit sportier touch indeed. And we'll see if this one has any effect on the interior later on. And the rear overhang is a little bit shorter. It's about 10 centimeters or four inches shorter than the short wheelbase Range Rover. So from this dimension you know, aspect, not too much big difference than between Range Rover Sport and Range Rover. Astonishing, isn't it? Wheels from 21 to 23 inch. These here are the biggest 23 inch wheels. We'll also test in the driving part if this will have an effect on comfort. Once again, the beautiful copper accentuations, really liked here in the autobiography trim. And also technology highlight, next to the air suspension, which is standard, you can also get a 7.3 degrees opposite direction steering rear axle. This is a maximum 7.3 degrees where the rear wheels steer in the opposite direction than the front wheels are turning in. And that gives you more agility in slower driving and also better in the basement garage. Turning circle is reduced and so on. So this makes this car so much more agile and easier to steer around parking in and out. In the rear, also a calm and seamless design. And I think that's a great step in this new generation. So far, Land Rover design over the last decade or so tended to be, yes, very modern, but I would say too many different elements. Here now, they calmed it a little bit down. Nice, slim integration also of the tail lamps right here. Soon take a look at the turning indicators. And in the lower part in the rear, is that a case for the autocrew fake exhaust police? Let's take a look. You know, they're also active in the UK. No, it's not. Actually, this is a very interesting piece. So this exhaust really has a transition from small to wide. Wow, this is, yeah, this is how we do it and still keep it real indeed. Not bad. And the turning indicators in the rear. Yeah, no, you always love to see that. Look at that here with a nice cascading effect. Interesting also these two top fins, whereas we have in the left one, an additional camera. The normal rear view camera is above the number plate and we will soon show you the difference in the view. Now to the interior. This one here is the key fob of, of a 100k plus Range Rover or Range Rover Sport. Really Land Rover? You can do better, can't you? Then here the door handles, they are flush. That means when you close the vehicle here, even surface, aerodynamics and so on. When you open them again like this and you can grab on the inside, but listen to these electric motors. Oh, really? Uh, okay, but let's take a look at, well, you can also do it like here, but pressing here. That sounds weird, right? But then again, what about door closing sound? That's quite okay. Um, and here also like the, um, you know, how it resonates from the haptic quality. That's actually quite nice. Then interior of the doors or inside of the doors. Look at that. Everything you see is animal free from the materials. I applaud them for that. Really well done. 
um, there are two um, versions of that one. Either here with this navy blue style, and you see it matches the exterior color of the car so well also on the interior. And the other alternative would be more this gray fabric style, more of that kind of. And you also have it on the seat and then black on the inside. We've seen that from, for example, on the Range Rover Brother. Details at the inside of the doors here. Look at that. There's a new structure here. It looks really cool and just unique. And no matter where we look, like here the gray fabric, then here this navy blue style, soft touch, soft touch here, soft, even soft here in the lower part, not like super soft at the top part, but even here. No, just plain black plastic. I hardly see that anywhere in the automotive industry. So, and this material here, they call it Ultra Fabrics. This is kind of like a neoprene-like material. It's a mix of leatherette and um, uh, and microfiber. So it is not entirely slick, but also not super rough, something in between. But it is so great from the build quality, really awesome. The seat control, by the way, is here at the inside. So let's take a look at the seat. So here again, the Ultra Fabrics have a very nice touch. They're very soft, also perforated, and heating and cooling is available. Also perforation here in the top part. So this looks awesome and also feels really great. Really like it also here at the outside part. This is a little bit different from the texture here. So very interesting what I've done here. Also interesting here in the autobiography, we have these high floor mats here. So a high soft fabric. We really like to have that one also in the top luxury trim. Seating position is what they call command driving position at Land Rover or Range Rover. Good view to the front and these seats are really not only ultra fabrics but also ultra comfortable. So very soft cushion indeed and don't forget you can also get here these additional armrests here on the other side and then yeah that's the traveling feeling then indeed. Interior overview, really impressive look, luxurious atmosphere, also materials, nice haptic and also that soft touch, both top and lower part here in this navy blue once again. Glove box is a split dual one, lower part dampened here, also nice from the build quality and goes back automatically a little bit like this. 13.1 inch touch screen in the middle part, soon more details to that, steering wheel, Looks also pretty modern and clicking sound. It is this one button high gloss atmosphere. Don't like it that much, but it is backlit and also gives you some feedback. And then 13.7 inch digital instruments. They are really crisp actually, so great resolution for them. So pretty cool. You can also have a small map in there, but only from the car internal GPS actually. And you can also change the whole layout. For example, then also for a full screen mat, but it doesn't work with Apple CarPlay. You might remember the secondary camera in the back. That's why it's for. This is the digital rear mirror that when you pack everything full for your holiday trip in the rear, you can still see what's going on behind you. Infotainment system. This is here the Apple CarPlay, Apple Maps integration, for example, and Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, both wireless or wired possible. And wow, what a crisp display and also large integration. That's really very well done. And we also have the Meridian 3D sound system in here. Let's listen. Hmm. Really cool. So, ah, nice 3D sound. Love that. So we can recommend that. And then what about the car map or the car internal menu? Sorry about that. So here you have this overview like this. You also four wheel drive information and so on. It looks very cool visually, definitely. You also have this main menu here. You get along with that. You have to learn it a little bit. Here there's also the 4x4 mode, for example, that you can see, you know, you can also activate the differential locks there. You can see the altitude and the, you know, angles and so on. It's a quite cool feature indeed. So I'm also actually happy with the responsiveness of the system. And what's um, also pretty cool is here, you know, all the cameras and so on. Really crisp. This is a special view here with, I can also turn on the vehicle and show you. Um, so let me see, talk about that. There we go. So now I can also turn the wheels. You can see here, right wheel, left wheel. And you also see I have this log right there. And the reason for that is, 
And first of all, show you. Rear oh, this is like the raindrop, you know. Sorry about that, but the resolution is really good. But the cool thing is, when I drive to the front now and click this, this is now the see-through camera for the bonnet. And you can see I placed this small branch right there. And now I approach it, and then we can. That. There we go. It took a while, but then you can see. See here that the branch is then underneath the vehicle. Maybe it works even better when I reverse a little bit more and then once again to the front. So here we go, see through camera. And then underneath the vehicle is not a live image, but it's basically built up by the past image. There we go. And then I can see where is the log underneath. And then I see, for example, when there would be like a, a like a stone or something that I don't hit it or something. So um, yeah, that might be a good feature when off-roading. The inductive charging bit, by the way, is here underneath the screen, so kind of hidden, but then you put it in there. Um, also fits for bigger phones, by the way. And then this climate dial, really cool to control the while driving, straightforward. But they didn't want to have like three turning dials, and that's why you lift this one here, and then you can control the vent strength. Or when you press, you're back in the temperature mode, and then you press once more, and then you can go for the cooled seats or for the seat heating so also to control while driving is a very interesting solution indeed what do, what do you think about this you also have the same dial here for the passenger side and then oh the sticker here for winter tires 240 kilometers max come on who's driving 240 kilometers in winter time with winter tires um yeah but these stickers then always when we have winter tires in germany but you could also remove them start stop is here then there's still a manual volume jog and this is the shifting lever once again also with this very nice structured surface then just pull it down for drive mode and one more for the s mode oh then the engine also goes on here and on the right side here then this is like auto terrain select but you can also pull it up and then you can select the driving modes yourself for example like for snow ruts sand and so on most of time off-road modes or also the dynamic mode and here this uh, um, this button here is for the low range and you have to put it in neutral and then you can also use this um, transfer case uh, that hill descent control is also activated by that then or in the middle part this would be the the button to go all EV with the plug-in hybrid panoramic roof yeah you can either have it really dark in here or first of all open this shade takes a while but it goes really all over the vehicle and then it's a beautiful view then to the sky and when we have finished that one i can also open that whole thing because it's also one that can actually be opened wow that's really all over the vehicle here we go either this step or then opening it all the way and it's really wide and very long indeed and this large middle console good material here open this one some space and then you have this cool box here two levels of cooling then it's also illuminated pretty spectacular so it's really very cool indeed then there and then in the front part you can slide this one open have adaptive cup holders they're very wide indeed but you can slide also this one completely back and then have usb a and usb c charging down there with more space and just under the middle console there is another hidden usb c charger then the rear seating area also with this nice blue look here, same good material. And then we get on the inside here, shoe tap of course. Oh, look at that here at the inside of the windows. It's a manual shade in here, especially for the kids and so on. It's good. And once again, great quality also at the rear here. Really like that. Um, yeah, rear leg room. It works for four or five tall else. You see here, not plenty of leg room considering the length of the vehicle that you would only have in the long wheelbase version then of the Range Rover. Headroom wise with 189 or 6 foot 2. Yeah, it works, but of course this has a sport yeah, roof line so you lose a little bit of headroom, but you see here it also works for tall adults, it's no problem. Then as for the seats here, yeah, there we are. You can also put it here this a little bit more backward for a relaxed position or more upright for more there. Yeah engaged position <laughs> so to speak let's take a look at the middle part here yeah i mean it's not as comfortable as on the outside parts because the back part is kind of stiff so more focused here on the outside seats but you can also live with that what i also found cool 
here the back part of the top of the front seat here the top part once again also with this you know like this leather red microfiber mix once again very interesting from the haptical aspect and also here the lower part this one here is not just plain black plastic it also has this coating basically and thus feels just more premium and even here on the rear door in the lower part there is this once again so Hardly I have ever seen now recently such attention to detail whereas in some new generation of new even luxury vehicles They maybe go here and there for cost savings This one here is very well executed that they say like hey great materials everywhere you look Yeah, they also have weaknesses like sounds from electric motors here and there but also definitely their strength and it's really the thing often about these British luxury vehicles that you have something about Oh, awesome and uh, really but never you know in between that's really interesting isn't it well I have also bought British luxury vehicles myself in the past and because they always have something definitely don't they and another example for that is here look at that this armrest here for the middle part on the one hand you think like really and then it kind of like goes shouldn't be like like this but then you think like, why but then again you have two nice buttons in here where you're saying like oh these buttons are really nice and you have more space and also a couple of us here they're also adaptive yeah once again everywhere you look and once in here also like this one here is with the you no know, you know with this premium material also soft touch here on top a part of that um yeah it's really everywhere you look you have this super great but then uh, think about this also for example with illuminated seat belt holders let's take a look at the trunk or the boot in this case it's really the boot i would say right for a british vehicle then let's take a look here the cabin trolley fits in also the vertical way easy then this rail here left and right also keeps it in place maybe because it's very cold outside that it's not sliding down that fast uh, that quickly here maybe that's that's the reason and then interesting is as for dimension this one here is the plug-in hybrid so um we have of course the battery stored in the lower part and we can put this one here up this is then secure for example like the separator or maybe put something here it's a good solution uh, actually and of course the big difference is here this is like this even loading sill and the Range Rover would have this separate flap that opens here the Range Rover Sport is opening in like this the length here is a little bit shorter than the mirror of 40 inches there is where the Range Rover has more length and then the width here is it's actually quite cool it's like a like one meters 10 or 43 inches and the height here 77 centimeters or 30 inches overall well usable what about folding the seat well, this is also um, uh, actually easily done here and here. You press these buttons and then both seats fold or seat halves fold. The electric motors sound a little bit weird, right? But that way is a very nice solution, good in the handling. And let's see to the seat as I would be driving. This is a total length of about 1 meters 80 or 70 inches. We see a lot of good stuff here in this vehicle, but here, build quality wise, ah, who thought of that? I mean, this integration is somehow not right for a premium vehicle. However, the function here again for the seats also goes in reverse. That is then, of course, even more practical when you don't have to do it yourself and can also fold the seats up again from the rear here. Powertrains, really interesting. We've seen this trend, Mercedes with the C63 going from 8-cylinder to 4-cylinder. Range Rover says, hold my British beer or my ale. <laughs> hey, let's go 6-cylinder and 8-cylinder only. Well, and then you have a 3-liter 6-cylinder diesel or a 3-liter 6-cylinder petrol engine, inline 6-cylinder, either pure petrol or base here for the plug-in hybrid drivetrain in two different horsepower versions. This one here, the P510e. And when it says P510, it means this is the horsepower figure. So easy to read the engine versions of Jaguar Land Rover. I applaud them for that in this case. Still, it remains a rearable bias with this all-wheel drive and the pure electric range around 100 kilometers or 60 miles. Well, this one, this drivetrain with 32 kilowatt hour net battery, so reasonably sized battery, 
you want to be even faster because this one here, 5.4 seconds in the acceleration figure, only faster is the 4.4 liter V8 supplied by BMW than 4.5 seconds in the acceleration figure. And what else is there to come? All electric in 2024. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the new Range Rover Sport. Here in the plug-in hybrid version, that means it's the second quickest version behind the V8. Here 5.4 seconds is the official acceleration figure. I can also put here into the dynamic mode. Interestingly, um, it doesn't mean that it directly goes into petrol mode, but at the moment we are in the petrol uh, mode. Later more about the hybrid drive system. Now we start from 50 kilometers now, let's go. Fifty, one eighty, and two hundred kilometers an hour, one twenty five miles an hour. Oh, now, wow, significant wind noise is here picking up here. Then that's interesting. So below it, it's okay, but not above two hundred kilometers an hour. But still, I mean, we are like a driving cupboard basically, and the Range Rover Sport with a little bit sport here approaching the big Range Rover brother. Soon also more to the comparison. Feels very settled here on the road. Steering at higher speeds is a little bit weak. Um, it's also better at lower speeds. Now hitting the brakes. And of course here with the plug-in hybrid we can also use recuperation. If there's more braking power needed, then we also use the real brakes. But of course the plug-in hybrid does save some of the real brakes. So you don't have to switch them the disc that often. Very interesting, definitely. And here, very silent and now at normal highway speeds, so that's this noise insulation. Holy! F the hell? So, I'm not sure if you've seen the sign, but this is here 80 kilometers an hour speed limit before this tunnel, and that was like 160 or something in the Ford Fiesta. Whoa. Okay. Well, you see a lot of things in, on public roads, for sure. <laughs> Here in the tunnel now, um, yeah, you can see very, very nicely these instruments and the infotainment system. Very crisp, also in the dark to see that everything, but not too much ambient lighting though. But I can also see the illuminated buttons, so when I want to control something while driving, it's easy to do so. And told you that in the interior part. It has a straightforward user interface for the climate unit and so on, so you can easily indeed switch that through while driving, so I'm really, really happy with that. The key thing here always of the Range Rover or Range Rover Sport is this command driving position. King of the road experience, you sit high, you have the standard air suspension, when you have waves or something, it really, you know, like evens out everything in a very smooth way. It feels so luxurious while driving. That's awesome. The only thing is here, we are equipped with the 23 inch wheels, the biggest wheels that are available for this vehicle. And these are making some smaller, you know, bumps on the road kind of uncomfortable. So I would not go with the 23 inch wheels. They look great from the outside, yes, but rather stick at least 22. If not, I would really recommend start with the base 21 inch wheels. They just make the ride more comfortable and then you really have the most comfortable ride. Here now this area is a little bit higher. This is also interesting. I um, sometimes tend to activate the off-road gauges here because then I also see the altitude changes. And we start at 64 meters above sea level and here now 230 meters above sea level. And you can see that these couple of like 150 meters or something, they are often a difference between snow and not snow. Very interesting, definitely. And here now, this heated front screen, they do not use a modern foil, but these, you know, you know, these visible heating lines inside. And yeah, I, I personally, myself, I, well, especially when you're driving like here against a white wall at this moment with this fog, I majorly see that and to me it is indeed a disturbing thing so I would rather go without it however it's of course a helpful feature but I don't understand why in such a luxury car they don't use these foils you know 
Yes, they are supposed to be not that efficient as the individual heating lines, but still, I mean, like a Seat Ateca or a VW Tiguan has this foil inside and you don't see it, but still you have a great heated windshield. So, oh, there's a for a new Ford Ranger. You can also check out the Ford Ranger review, of course, here on Auto to Fuel. Now getting back again on the motorway. And it really depends on the driving mode. In the dynamic, dynamic mode, this is some red background, it's not always that the car is um, hopping into there again, for example, it's going back to the electric. So it really depends, um, but it prefers the petrol engine a little bit more. But when I, for example, press the auto mode on the drive mode selector, auto terrain response selected, then the car is more, you know, really seeing like what's happening at the moment and then selecting the driving mode depending on the condition. And then most of the time when the battery is charged, this car is firstly using the electric drive and it's awesome. It drives very, very silently. You still have some acceleration possibility. And then when you push the throttle a little bit more, then the petrol engine hops on. You can also see that in here in these gauges whenever the petrol engine is on, but this three cylinder, sorry, three liter inline six cylinder. Yeah. Oh God, three, <laughs> three cylinder. That was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, so this three liter inline six cylinder is actually also notably silent in this vehicle. So the transitions between electric drive and the petrol engine is also kind of smooth. Let me go back to the dynamic mode again. And what we can also do is put the shifting mode to S. And this will even boost up acceleration. I won't be driving too fast now. I'm not sure how wet this part is. It's not too wet the road, although, let's see. Yeah, it looks quite good. But when I'm now here into this um, S shifting mode, you realize that the gears will be turned up higher. Let's let's take a look. There we go. It's 150. Yeah, that's for enough for now in this corner here. All-wheel drive, of course, always with the rear wheel bias. That's cool. But here, once again, when we are at high speeds, I think the steering is too vague. It doesn't give me the best contact feeling over the vehicle, I think. I already experienced that in the Range Rover Brother. Here in the Range Rover Sport, I feel that at lower speeds, the steering is, to me, a little bit more likable. But here's just the problem that at higher speeds, I lose a little bit of feeling for the steering. But again, the focus of this vehicle is also not driving that fast and super, super dynamic. Although the name says Range Rover Sport, it's more this cruising feeling, king of the road experience and enjoying that great air suspension. And I really, really love that. So when you focus that, then it's actually okay. And when you now think Range Rover versus Range Rover Sport here in this new generation, I don't feel there is a big difference. And the thing is also considering they have same wheelbase in the short wheelbase version, which I have also driven, the difference is really not that large. Yes, it has some sport here touch here, that it's a little bit shorter in the rear with the overhang that brings some more sportiness definitely. Oh no, there's salt on the windscreen, it's not that good. So, and you know, steering to me a little bit better in the feeling. So when I could choose between Range Rover and Range Rover Sport, I would indeed choose the Range Rover Sport driving wise. Feels a little bit sportier indeed, a little bit more fun to drive. At the same time, you don't lose anything. The only reason to go for the Range Rover would actually be if you want that long wheelbase version for more you know, chauffeur purposes uh, in the rear and so on. But if you think about the short wheelbase version, you might as well save 20k or something and then pick the Range Rover Sport. That's, you know, that, that's my take. And this hybrid drivetrain here is to me is really nice. I'm going to go back to the driving mode, also the normal D mode once again, and also push in the terrain response mode and then everything is done automatically. So I feel the transitions are handled very, very nicely. So for example, in the Mazda CX-60 plug-in hybrid, um, there we had like stronger transitions between the drives, but here I think done in a really fluent way. And this battery size also gives you enough pure electric driving. As I said, it could up, up to be 100 kilometers or 60 miles, but that's a maximum figure actually. You obviously think about it in, in real um, world figures, but this is already a preview also of the all-electric Range Rover or Range Rover Sport coming in 2024. 
when they manage to do that. So at least uh, that's that's planned that way. And that is actually an, an awesome experience indeed. At the same time, at this moment when you cannot recharge frequently, you also have that you, you know that you get rid of this range anxiety. Heated scenery wheel is available on the scenery here with the button. Nice clicking sounds here also with the buttons on the steering wheel. And then we also have all of the assistance systems. For example, I can um, you know I can I can set cruise control on the steering wheel. It depends on also of course which trim you have which one you have and which one you don't. Cruise control, for example, is set here on the steering wheel, plus and minus and so on. And then also the distance to the car in front of me is being kept adaptive cruise control. I can also adjust the distance here with the steering wheel buttons. So far so good. And also there's a separate button then for the active lane keeping assist. So it's also easy to activate or deactivate it. And it really depends on when the car is realizing when it's able to do that. Here at the moment there's a road without a middle wide line and so the car says, eh, no, I'd rather not do that. So let's see if that changes as soon as a middle wide line appears. What is very interesting is also the rear axle steering and it gives you a new agility feeling for that. So especially at, then at lower speeds, at lower speeds it's going in the opposite direction than the front wheels up to 7.3 degrees and that's kind of astonishing it's really high figure we only know from mercedes that in their non-amg models they sometimes even now offer up to 10 degrees in some models for example in the new c-class or also in the eqs then as an, as an option but here quite wide and that gives you a lot of agility is easier to maneuver in and out in in the basement garage for example so that helps you parking in and out this huge SUV and also gives you a lot of driving fun at lower speeds indeed. Yes, rear axle steering always feels a little bit unnatural, but definitely it's a very good feature here for this vehicle. It's standard for the plug-in hybrid. Depending on the engine version, it's an option you really have to go deep into the prices and the configurator when that you, your market configure it together with your engine pick actually. But now the question is, it says Range Rover Sport, or as Gary McGovern, <laughs> a Land Rover designer, would say, Range Rover Sport. Then <laughs> we have to see how much sport is there in this vehicle. All right, one more time, dynamic mode and also S Sport shifting mode. We have, of course, a power for both drivetrains. Let's see how sporty is it. Yeah, I think steering once again could be a little bit more connected to the vehicle. Oh, what that, that rear axle steering. It's kind of like the rear is like floating around. Not in a bad way, in a good way. That's really cool. Let's see how far I've turned the steering wheel here. Almost one way around. Rear axle or rear axle bias as well. Yeah. Ah, it's a little bit... Mm, see, like... At first, it doesn't come that fast, and then you get a, a, an enormous push by that electric drive as well. So not the most harmonious acceleration feeling. So indeed, yeah, I think this this combination that um, the power sets in in a you know quite spontaneous way then, but just after a short while, together with the wake steering, I have to say. No, it is definitely not focused on driving fun, even though here this badge says Range Rover Sport. So yeah, that's the catch. I really love driving this vehicle, but not for its sportiness, but rather automatic driving mode, the Range Rover or Range Rover Sport, even though this one has, you know, this little sportier touch, these vehicles are for the king of the road driving experience and for enjoying you know this floaty ride this is the main focus and this they are still doing in a very very nice way and also the seats here for long-term comfort are really great this ultra fabrics all vegan interior as i said earlier even the steering wheel it feels better even than the you know old school solutions and they also test them for long-term durability in the test facilities actually. So great job as for this. Um, they really have brought this vehicle here into the modern era with 
the plug-in hybrid drivetrain, which has useful electric drive only also as for the range and together with the more modern interior. So, yeah, the Range Rover has been criticized for being not sustainable and so on for, for decades, of course, because it's this huge SUV and so on. But this is then indeed, um, you know, at this moment, the best sustainable option also for a Range Rover. And yeah, I think this is really getting this brand into a modern era, considering also the problems they had in the recent years. And they are, you know, they're, they are still struggling uh, financially, definitely. There are still these outsiders in a way. Yes, they're not the classic Audi, BMW, Mercedes and so on. But that's exactly the reason why people buy this vehicle, to be more special, to be more unique and enjoy this you know, still beloved British luxury aspect. So, when the question is, can it key up to the Germans in a way? Not dynamic-wise, as I just said, but and on the luxury level and also now this new approaches yeah it is definitely a very competitive product it's just a question like what do you exactly want and when you want that great luxury experience that's just a little bit more personal and unique then it's definitely wor you know worth thinking about it a full driving review of the updated vw touareg as you might know this is also a sibling to the audi q8 the Porsche Cayenne and the Bentley Bentayga and the chassis all built in the very same factory and this one here is basically the cheapest of the siblings. Is this a strong thing for the Touareg or is there more and what have they changed? Let's find out with Thomas Nautogefühl in 4K full screen full length. Let's go here with the front which has been updated here with the very nice horizontal stress. Look at that this integrated light strip here in the middle now and new headlamps now HD matrix so you have an elaborated high beam function for example a new three element daytime light signature and you only see it really from the very front then they are very visible and you can also change a lot with the lights in the infotainment system we'll take a look at that very soon turning indicators in the front dual styling in a way because you have the cascading function at the same time it comes like a live in a pulsing style so either we usually see either or in this case they have combined both of these effects 4 meters 88 or 192 inches is the length here of the tour rack 19 to 22 inch wheels these ones here are black 20 inch wheels with winter tires so they look in comparison a little bit smaller new here with the face is a roof sensor so it detects if you have roof weight or not and then the suspension is tuned accordingly and that is giving you actually a better ride also when you do not have some weight on the roof because before they had to calculate or set up the suspension that it would work with or without roof weight in both cases so a better setup in now for the suspension base versions of the tour rack will not get hd matrix lamps and also have the standard suspension most tour racks being sold will now have the hd matrix lamps and the air suspension this one here in the elegance trim however then for the plug-in hybrid the usually available rear axle steering and the enter tilt control not available for the plug-in model and the rear here with the very nice cascading turning indicators and new signature at the sides also in the middle part and also illuminated vw logo here in red that looks really striking big tuareg lettering so i think the rear is the thing that has changed most visually here with the face do you like it and for example here in the iq light settings then you can also change the animations for the you know that's a welcome and goodbye light key fob slim nice good then door closing sound very solid I like that you can also get a soft closing here like that nice then inside of the doors really wrapped tightly looks like good build quality here we have matte wood decor element for example and the inside door pockets let's check that out also have some felt covering at the lower part for example then interior here with some capacitive bs touch buttons at the steering wheel 
Yeah, they're not that good to use. At least we have the heated steering wheel command directly at the steering wheel as well. Then we have control stitches here on the soft touch dashboard. Seats, sadly, only animal skin available. So there are no alternatives there on the horizon. They will also not change that. But of course, different with the new ID models, for example. The seating comfort in general on these Ergo Comfort seats, however, is really good. Then you have this upright seating position, command driving position, and the headroom here with 189, 602, still left. And you also have this panoramic roof. And the cool thing is, this is actually one you can still really open. And there's also a shade available if there is a really, really hot day. But like that, you can leave a lot of fresh air in. Then here, the middle console, you have adaptive cup holders and it works for large bottles as well. Very good build quality here, still. A, turning jog here for the volume also it's an interesting sound also this real shifting lever for the automatic gearbox that is cool however what i don't favor that much is here this front cubby hole you slide this one open and then you see already like your, your hand is almost, almost like you know getting stuck in there and then when you want to push it back again like you have to really push it hardly in um, so yeah that's not ideal in the front inductive charging pad and USB-C charging and then here this really large armrest very well attached and USB-C chargers underneath and what they have updated here with the face is here this knee pad at the inside middle console on the driver's side this one here is softer however not on the passenger side interior cockpit overview here the steering wheel goes electrically in and out up and down and you have this Innovision cockpit that has this one unit but consists of two different screens 15 inch here so overall a really nice and likable design here once again with these matte wood inlets and you can also get this head-up display the infotainment has been updated is it super quick now not really however this main menu looks better now and that one also works faster most of the time you will use apple carplay and with auto integration that looks like this goes all the way here that's pretty cool and one thing you actually have to know is where are the options here hmm. so you go to vehicle and then you ask yourself okay what else is there and then there it is there are the settings and then you can go through all the stuff so you just have to know that it's there climate control by the way here plus and minus and here for the seat heating or the seat cooling and the DIN audio sound system is really nice, like that. And this is your drive control center. You can go sport mode, but also to the off-road modes and so on. And you can also individually pump up the air suspension, but it also goes accordingly to the driving modes. And when it's dark and the headlamps are on, you can see the ambient lighting. Pretty cool here. And it's also split. You can change the lower part, like this line here, and the cup holders. Or you can also just change the upper part there with the integrated Touareg logo. That looks really spectacular. And of course, you can also sync that if you like. Yeah, pretty cool, isn't it? And here at the side, you have a nice puddle light to show you the way to the door. And now Leah is showing you a very interesting feature with the sun blinds right there because there is a double one. Not many cars have that anymore. So here for the side sun, for example, and then when you have like special light situations where you, yeah, it kind of comes from both sides, you can protect yourself. Definitely have enough space here as a tall adult, here knee room wise, even if a tall driver is driving like this. And also as for the headroom with 189 or six for two is fine with this panoramic roof. Very nice and upright seating position. You can also vary here the back angle of the seat, more sleeping position or more upright. This middle seat here has this huge middle tunnel, but an own climate unit as well. And even cooler in this lower unit there. Look at that when you put this one open, USB-C charging now and a real powered socket here, 230 volt, that's nice. And actually also the middle seat is fairly comfortable and that is not that you know, that, that often with the vehicles. And you can put down this here for a couple of They are not adaptive though. Oh, and I like this manual rear shade here. Very nicely cut out. And also this top part here is soft touch at the rear. Well, look at these touch lights here in the rear. They are nice, aren't they? 
The trunk or the boot, 810 liters or 655, a little bit reduced for the plug-in hybrid. However, good width here, more than a meter of 40 inches. The length is about 90 centimeters or 30 six inches and here the height a little bit less than 80 centimeters or 30 inches overall quite good result you can fold the seats right here left and right easily done you can then put the seats really flat from the passenger cabin if you like and the overall length to the seats we're having here a little bit more than 170 meters or 67 inches the charging cable needs to be stored right here you can also put that one flat here our battery vacuum cleaner just so everything always cleaned for you and what's also interesting is that we can lower the vehicle if you have the air suspension to load in and out things easier and also the towing hook can be folded out electrically right here at the bottom takes some seconds there we go nice Touareg is now all about the 3 liter v6 tdi the diesel or the tsi the turbo petrol engine this is also the basis for the plug-in hybrid version here, the V6 TSI. And usually the acceleration figure here is around 6 seconds. Classic all-wheel drive with some rear-wheel bias. And in the plug-in hybrid version, then you also have an integrated electric motor, so it doesn't change the all-wheel drive distribution. However, with the update here now, still at 14 kWh net with the plug-in hybrid battery, they did not go for the battery upgrade like with the Porsche Cayenne. Hmm. So definitely a reason less to go for the plug-in hybrid and also the consumption, which is still super, super high, around 13 liters here for the plug-in hybrid when the battery is depleted, which is very interesting or important because usually when, for some reason, we had the Toyota Prius, the plug-in hybrid version, and when the battery was depleted there, the hybrid system was working like it would be an inbuilt hybrid system. Here, it does not work at all. When the battery is depleted, you have actually even higher consumption than you would have with a pure petrol engine just off the you know the increased weight and so on and in general i have used this very engine here in several other models of the corporation and here it's the highest in the consumption even comparing to the audi q8 and the porsche cayenne hmm. welcome to thomas's driving lounge bw tour rec sport mode 70 kilometers an hour to Plop, 120. Hmm, that was quick. Really nice. Acceleration figure for the V6 TSI, usually around 6 seconds. And when you have the plug-in hybrid version here, due to the increased weight, the normal PF is a little bit slower. And the R PF, which has the same tech, it's just a little bit tuned higher. That one is a second quicker than the pure petrol engine, actually. But all then more or less in the same region. And here on the motorway, German Autobahn is a very good vehicle for that because it's super comfortable with its upright seating position. It's also decently silent even at higher speeds here, although it's pushing the wind most obviously. And suspension, here yeah, the air suspension is doing a good job. In the sport mode, by the way, it goes a little bit stiffer then. And when you cl would close your eyes now, theoretically, obviously I won't do it now. <laughs> yeah, here is also. He's not gonna do that, is he? <laughs> I feel that this is very similar to the other siblings. So, yes, of course, they're trying to sell you, especially the Cayenne and the Bentayga, for double the money or maybe even more. Are they worth it, technology-wise? Well, plug-in hybrid sense, in a plug-in hybrid sense, the Cayenne gets a bigger battery now. That is a significant technology difference, yes. And also this one here doesn't get the rear axle steering as a plug-in hybrid, but generally speaking, they are all more or less the same vehicle. And of course, Audi, Porsche and Bentley doesn't, don't want to hear that because they charge you much more money than here for the Touareg. But it's just the case. They are built in the very same factory. Yes, the Bentley is then shipped over and then finished with all the details, but all the tech that is installed, they're built in the same factory and it's more or less the same vehicle not in the way of that it's like pure batch engineering. There are differences, but the base feeling of that platform here is more or less the same, and it's a good one, you know. Also with this even entry, uh, you know, like the door sill to the floor mat and so on. And it just works. It's a very good product overall, no matter which one you pick of those. Here, let's go back. Yeah, we are still in sport mode. Acceleration because we have freeway here now actually to unlimited speed 
also shows me that sign in the instruments. And let's see also um, this car pass here, by the way, here, when I use the turning indicators, this blind spot monitor is also giving me another flash symbol, so an additional warning. And now from 100 kilometers an hour, we're already at speed, let's check the acceleration, let's go. Forty, one sixty, one seventy, one eighty, and now we cancel just for security reasons. Now we have some recuperation finally from the plug-in hybrid, so good acceleration. And also, still, I mean, considering it's a large SUV, very silent here, good noise insulation. Leah always has a very good sense for the noise. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, she has better ears than, than I do, so, or maybe, <laughs> probably I went too often clubbing when I was younger. But I, I always wear earplugs, you know, but still, maybe that's the case, or I don't know. <laughs> she can hear much better than, than I do. Um, and that's always a good sign. So it's very calm and relaxing, especially on long motorway trips. And of course, then usually you would go back to the normal mode. You also can charge, by the way, the battery while driving, but that's not efficient at all, doesn't make any sense. And then there are also these off-road modes, for example. This is an off-road capable vehicle. We also have special off-road episodes of the Touareg from this generation. They are super interesting to watch. You can uh, check them all out. It's easy, by the way, to find it also when you use the YouTube search and just put in Autogefühl, so our channel name, you don't have to use the German umlauts. With you, it will work as well. And just out of fuel to a wreck. And then you'll find all of these episodes. For example, we've been driving this one off road in Morocco, which was a very epic ride, definitely. So, here now again on the gas. Very good performance and also steering input. It's pretty precise, good reactions. Even the lane changes is very good. Let's do one at 150 kilometers an hour. Go here, really nice, doesn't shake up too much. The setup is actually quite sporty. I feel that the setup is a little bit sportier than the previous, you know, like it's pre facelift version. Maybe has to do with this new roof sensor or so, um, because now it's feeling, hey, there's no roof float on it, so I can put the suspension in a way that it's better for the handling without weight on the roof. That might be something about that. Do I miss the rear axle steering? On the motorway obviously not, but in the, steer in, the, in the city yes, definitely. So, especially on tight European roads or parking in and out, basement garage, the rear axle steering definitely makes a lot of sense and is not available for the plug-in hybrid version. So, in Europe probably it is wiser to still go with the diesel for this version here. Yeah, we have to say that for the lowest fuel consumption. Kind of irritating, by the way, here says software version. When you change the temperature, here in, you're in the CarPlay mode, everything in the background gets dark. What is this? And why? Or here, when you use the seat heating or something, don't see a good reason for that. Only if you use the car internal GPS and then go for the temperature, it kind of gets blacked out. But, I mean, still, you can't see stuff <laughs> in the background. Yeah, I mean, w when they did the software update now, I don't know why they didn't consider this. So this should be better. Also, you know, let's see, I'm in here and then I want to go back to the CarPlay again. Um, then I have to wait again here for this overlay. But at least you have this, you know. So this is actually good that you have these top symbols you now and then you can switch back to the CarPlay, for example, right here. So overall, yeah, the software update still makes sense. This is also a little bit quicker and more reactive. Yeah. How well this one is driving is to me just this is like really the specialty of this vehicle. How good this platform here is driving that counts for the Q8 and the Cayenne and the Bentayga. And realistically, you really have to say the Touareg is the most clever choice of these ones because you just pay the least amount of money for more or less the same experience, especially when you're in a sport mode, it comes close to the Q8 or Cayenne experience. Yes, of course, the Cayenne will be even sportier, and there are sportier versions of that, and you can also get an A-cylinder. But just talking about what is the most clever choice for the majority of customers. Still, they do not offer any animal skin alternatives here, so that's what I would expect when I want to personally pick that vehicle. So that would be a deal breaker to me, but in general, of course, 
definitely a more clever choice in comparison to the more expensive models. And some city driving. So what I do criticize especially here about the plug-in hybrid version is usually when I have plug-in hybrids, especially Toyota ones, then it doesn't really matter if it's hybrid or plug-in hybrid. If the plug-in hybrid battery is depleted, it works like a hybrid still. And here, when I lift my foot on the throttle, it doesn't now, you know, like sometimes, in very rare occasions, it goes to there back, back again. So, like, just for a split second, it goes in the electric mode, and that's it. So, there's hardly any recuperation into the battery, and that is then used as the significant buffer to move the vehicle when you just slide your own throttle and so on. You hardly have any electric moments. So, this here only makes sense if you still get a governmental subsidy in your country for a plug-in hybrid, for example. Other than that, the plug-in hybrid version of the Touareg makes no sense at all. And also the Cayenne battery is not in here. So this one here is still at 14 kilowatt hours net. Maybe for rare, rare occasions where someone has like a driver profile, 10 kilometers every day to work and back again, you can charge it, work at home, drive electric and then on the weekend you drive with the petrol. That would make sense in a way, but all other cases, rather go for the pure petrol, or in this case, the pure diesel would also make sense. Yeah, as I said earlier, the fuel consumption is really, really high, and I had a lower fuel consumption with the pure petrol engine, actually. Pure electric driving, by the way, would work up to a speed of 140 kilometers an hour. What is very good, however, is the noise insulation. So it's really silent here, for example, around 100 kilometers an hour, around 60 miles an hour. Super easy, super comfortable as well. 20 inch wheels with window tires here. Have this upright seating position, good visibility round about. So this relaxed driving and traveling feeling, that is what makes this Touareg here so special, actually. Should Volvo still build the XC90? Watch this review and then tell me in the comments because recently they have launched the EX90. This is the all-electric version, so it is somewhat a successor of this one here, but a direct successor will not happen because Volvo will go all-electric eventually. This one is still their large SUV in the petrol lineup or with the plug-in hybrid as we have it here today. So is this one here still a legit gem in the SUV segment? Or is it maybe even better? from this Volvo generation, we're going to find out with Thomas on Autofuel in full screen, 4K, wait a minute, I always say 4K full screen fully. Let's go <laughs> here with the front. It's called Ultimate Bright, this whole trim level with the bright chrome fins here and so on, together with the denim blue color. Yeah, I think I, I nailed this one today, didn't I? You know, there's also one of my hobbies to dress accordingly to the car color, always when I know the car color. Sometimes I don't. Thor's hammer LED lamps, and when you hit the turn indicator, then also there they appear. So I think it's always a beautiful structure. And in comparison to the nowadays electric vehicle styling, which is more about aerodynamics, this one here really stands upright as an SUV as we know it. Four meters 95 or 195 inches is the length of the XC90, and we can still see this really large greenhouse, upright windows. Once again, a uh, true difference to the new EV models, which are also a little bit, you know, tighter here and everything about aerodynamics. 19 inch to 22 inch. These ones here are 20 inches, somewhat in between. Let's see how that one performs with the air suspension today. Classic Volvo SUV tail lamp style in this vertical styling. And you can even see from the exterior how much space there is on the interior. Let's see more about the interior right now. Key fob is actually nothing special. Then the door closing sound is actually quite good. And then inside of the doors with a nice dual tone styling here. And I love this mad wood insert. Feel that also. Some say it's old school to have mad wood, but I just love it. What do you think? Tell me in the comments. Then we have this Bowers and Wilkins sound system here. We'll also take a look at that very soon. And on the interior, you also have this two-tone scheme available. You don't have to go for it. The base versions would also have a leather red steering available, by the way, as well as for the seats. But here in the higher 
T8 trim, they usually only offer animal skin, in parts at least. It's a mix, actually. There, the EX90, of course, offers more animal-friendly solutions already. Then, getting inside, you have this upright seating position, a lot of space, and it's so different to the new, all-new SUVs, because everything is upright, you have a lot of headroom, even with 189 or 6 foot 2, and yeah, you just feel this large greenhouse when you're sitting down here. Interior cockpit overview. They updated some things, zoom more to that. First of all, you can option also get this leather red dashboard. That's actually pretty cool, nice quality. And for example, if you compare it to the very early versions, here we have the new shifting lever that is a little bit more stylish, I would say. You're also nice with the matte wood inserts and you can slide this one open like this for the cup holders, for example. And this infotainment system, well, maybe the new vehicles offer a larger infotainment system but inside has been updated because here you also have the native Google Maps support here, Android Automotive based system now. And yeah, actually it's very decent that you have this inbuilt in your vehicle, pretty easy setup as for the menu structure, just for the climate, you always have to choose it here in the lower part for the vent strength and then for the temperature or when it's like this, you control the temperature here. Not too easy to do also for seat heating and the heated steering wheel. Um, yeah, I would like physical dials there. And you also have the Apple CarPlay integration. There we can also test this sound system. Wow, it's really great. I love that Bowers and Wiggins sound system in here, especially with a special feature because when you go here to the options list, then you can pick this Gothenburg concert hall and it sounds weird on radio but cool with music definitely and the Apple CarPlay integration by the way when you hit the map here is actually a little bit quicker than it is with the inbuilt Google Maps so maybe not the latest hardware behind it also new software here for the digital instruments for example you can also have this map view on the inside but only from the car internal GPS and you can also get a proper head-up display and under the armrest the cable connection then for the smartphone and to this large greenhouse concept also counts this first of all nice bright ceiling here with the microfiber then the bright cover as well and so much space above and next to your head that's what I love about this vehicle and you can still open this one you know the latest EVs and so on they usually have the fixed panoramic roofs which I don't really understand I would rather go for one that you can open or then go for a closed roof but the fixed glass roofs yeah is as always pro and cons to that definitely what do you think rear doors soft material also the nice matte wood and then we have a manual shade here especially for the kids so good build quality here and then the leg room here as the seat is i would be driving there's not so much leg room left considering the length but it works for tall adults the seats are all pretty high so I think they're more thought about kits here definitely in the rear bench which is of course fitting to the whole concept of the vehicle because this is here in the outside seats by the way here you can adjust the back part here a little bit and then we soon also go to the third seating row here in the middle seat this is really interesting look at that this is this integrated child seat you can push it up like this yeah and then you have this you know, somewhat child seat for the not too small ones, also a practical thing. And you can also sit in the middle here as an adult. That also works like this. Headroom also no problem at all. Huge panoramic roof. Well, and now to get into the third seating row, you pull it here at the top and then, well, to slide it forward takes some effort. And this is then the entry to the rear seat. Hmm, do I still have space there? Isofix? Not at all, so you cannot use it for Isofix space child seats in the rear there. Mm -hmm. And now my least favorite part, and yeah, I know you love it, and you can have like Thomas time code in the third seating row maybe. <laughs> so let's squeeze, squeeze myself in there. Like this, I already folded the middle seat down that I can have some chance to do that. And well, headroom wise, directly works I would say so that that's okay legroom is indeed the problem um, the ground here is a little bit uneven in the rear and you know I can't move these seats here much more forward you can slide all three individually but then you can see here legroom wise it does not work at all for tall adults that's the thing um, yeah I mean you have isofix here on these second seating row seats as I said third row no but it's more, yeah, I would say, like this middle seat here for children that are not that small, 
but at the same time also not that tall. As for the trunk or the boot, here the plug-in hybrid version loses some capacity here at 640 liters then, whereas the other one would be at 710 liters. Sorry, I need to cheat a little bit. First of all, I want to show you um, here when the trunk is closing. Just listen to that. I don't want to be between that, um, but I can test the child safety test uh, later on. First of all, let's take a look here. Great dimensions, right? First of all, some luggage inside. You can have a better understanding of it. And here the width is almost even between the wheel arches. It's like 115 in meters or 45 inches. That's good. And the standard length is about yeah, 125 in meters or 49 inches. So that's really decent. Here in the back part, you have this splitter that you can also have some backpacks in here. That nothing flies all over the place. Then we have the charging cable. You can either store it just there, really underneath it, yeah, maybe a little bit too shallow, probably. Con, you have to fold everything individually and you cannot do that from the back of the trunk. Pro, you have a nice folding mechanism here of the head restraints and then everything also folds really flat. Wow, look at that now, that setup is really well usable. Safety sensor test as promised, let's see. Yeah, I mean, it could be a little more sensitive, but overall, Definitely okay if it wasn't before this. <laughs> Under the hood, you always get a two liter four cylinder. In Europe, we still get the diesel. In the US, you can not only get the B5, but also the B6, so a little bit stronger petrol engine. And then there's the top engine, the T8, the plug in hybrid. Acceleration figure here around five seconds. 5.4 in the EU with a rear electric motor as the additional boost, so to speak. So the all-wheel drive indeed comes from that rear electric motor then, but it is actually always available. Then they have also recently upgraded the battery size now at 15 kilowatt hours net, so you will get some more pure electric range. And from our test, we're now at the pure electric range from about 60 kilometers or 40 miles and the petrol range considering it's about 10 liters on one kilometers, 23 mbg US, 28 mbg UK. When you drive with completely empty battery, and then you have some 700 kilometers, 430 miles of the petrol range. So overall combined, then really significant. Of course, you could also have a little bit less petrol consumption when you are in this hybrid mode and use more of the recuperation, even if you don't recharge it. But of course, in this case, it does make sense to recharge it. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the Volvo XC90 T8. That's still good all here in the driving. Let's find out. First of all, we're in this hybrid mode here. I'm driving all electric at this moment. When the battery is full enough, you can also change these driving modes here. If you, for example, in this hybrid mode, I can also go to pure. Then it would actually keep the EV mode as long as possible. At maximum speed, 140 kilometers an hour, pure electric. That's 87 miles per hour. And even if you're just all electric, it accelerates quite quickly. And in this pure mode, only if I would pin that down, that throttle completely, then the combustion engine would go on. Here in the hybrid mode, that then goes earlier. I also see in the instrument like this, there's like a small fuel drop where I see at which point the combustion engine would go on. And it, for example, would also go on if I pin it down here, of course, for our acceleration tests and let's go for example to the power mode then it is already on for the best acceleration possible 52 let's go well, that's 100 so you see decently quick and you also hear the combustion engine then if you ask yourself is that any good for the engine if it suddenly goes on and you rev it out no it's not so that is a problem with plug-in hybrids. They are a little bit stronger in some parts of the engine where the stress would be put on the engine, yes. But of course, it only helps when you really take care of that yourself. In that case, for example, I went for the charge mode before, so I can also charge the battery while driving, which doesn't make any sense efficiency-wise, but I just did it for this acceleration test that the engine is warm before and that I don't damage the vehicle or so. Here, 100 kilometers an hour, one more acceleration when we're already at speed. Let's go. 30, 50, and 180. Yeah. 
So power-wise, no problem at all. When the engine is really put under RPM pressure, then of course this 2.0-litre four-cylinder doesn't sound too good. The overall hybrid driving experience, when we go back to that again, is to me quite pleasant because you have a lot of electric moments even if the battery would be completely depleted. Then you lift your foot off the throttle, it usually then goes in the electric mode and feels kind of like an in-bit hybrid. And when you have recharged it, then you can also significantly drive all electric and that is happening very often. And as I said, realistic value about 60 kilometers or 40 miles pure electric range and you can do something with that. For example, your weekly commuting and so on. Wind noise or wind insulation, I think here at 130 kilometers an hour, so around 80 miles an hour, it is kind of windy outside today, you have to, have to say that. But it's actually decent, I would say. There are maybe some more silent competitors, but it's not bad at all. That's interesting how this rear wiper is hanging downwards like a tail. Interesting thing. <laughs> things you always see on the German Autobahn as well. Um, yeah, and even driving all electric. So most of the time I've been having this vehicle here um, at home now, I've been driving all electric and then recharging again. And here it really makes sense indeed, especially when you can charge it at home or so. By the way, I wouldn't necessarily say this counts for all XC90 models. It always depends on the individual vehicle. I feel that the steering wheel is a little bit offset here, you know. That would be straight, but then I'm going to the left. This is kind of like going straight and it's tilted to the right. I would like to hear your comments about that. Um, I'm really sensitive to that. I hate that, totally. And it's often that, you know, you do that in the workshop and also with the ele electronic steering wheel calibration and so on. Yeah, but I really like it that you can see that it's completely straight. Maybe you can fix it with a new electronic calibration of the steering wheel or something. Here, higher speed and lane change at 130 kilometers an hour. Let's do that. Yeah, you feel... <laughs> Leo's like, whoa. Yeah, it, you, you have this floating ship atmosphere, which is okay to the XC90 because you do have air suspension here, and I love that, and you have this floaty ride indeed. Therefore, it doesn't need to be that sporty. So if you compare it, for example, to the German competitors, this one definitely less sporty. Then there would maybe be a Mercedes GLE where you still also feel that air suspension you have. And then the other competitors where they go more in the sporty direction. Not necessarily without being less comfortable because it always depends. Floaty, yes, but it doesn't mean that it's the best comfort, you know. It's just a different feeling, I would say. Here, one problem I do feel is, although we have 20-inch wheels, not the largest ones, and we have the softer winter tires compound and the air suspension, when the road is uneven and we have some bumps in the road, then it does get through indeed. And I was wondering about that. So that was kind of strange. And I feel that is not the best as for the air suspension. Mm, I mean, the newer models there uh, are maybe a little bit better there in indeed so um, that that's the one thing I'm kind of a little bit disappointed of that we have you know this this uncovered from sudden bumps or potholes in the road that should be better with this tire and suspension setup other than that I feel it's a very relaxed ride and I love this open greenhouse atmosphere is very good for a long journey also as for the seat ergonomics and so on I said you can also get the full leather red seats for example in the US versions in the lower trim which is fine because I mean even considering the age of the vehicle you probably should not go for the highest trim then it doesn't pay off money wise it's still not a cheap vehicle at all so uh, a low entry version also has most of the features you, you actually need and then here when you are at relaxed speeds it's also really cool and, and calming on yourself here on the left side you activate the cruise control and it also has, if you want, the active lane keeping assist. So you can switch it if you want to have that or not. Here this would be the active lane keeping assist. Um, it is actually quite okay. There are also, for example, Audi, BMW, Mercedes offer smoother solutions, I would say. Here then, a little bit right and left. There you once again feel that it is a moving ship. It is really large. It is heavy. And 
which is still quite fun to steer around, but it doesn't give you that, that sporty character where most of the SUVs go towards that direction nowadays, but I think it's not a necessity actually to do that. You can also have something on the market which appeals to other customers who don't care about sporty driving, you know, and so on. And here we switch the motorways, it's always a good test and a lot of fun. There we go, and we can do one more acceleration in the power mode. Let's go from 70 kilometers an hour, let's go. Woo, 130. Ah, did that bump, you felt that, 160, and top speed, 185 kilometers an hour, so Volvo has limited that top speed for all of the models, that is the strategy, although I could theoretically go longer, and here at uh, top speed, actually also from the wind noise, yeah, yeah, of course, significantly louder than before, but still quite okay, I feel. There was one, this, I always use it as for good testing that road, this one fierce bump, this, you know, this in, in the road, where you really hurt, it, it hammered through, and usually that shouldn't happen with the vehicle with air suspension, so that was the uh, proof of the point I have been criticizing earlier. But overall, it's a very likable feeling here, and I mean, told, told you about the range beforehand, of course you could still drive way longer in that one than with the electric counterpart, the EX90, so range is of course still something you need to consider when comparing this one here against the all-electric brother and of course this greenhouse concept, more open space, more open feeling, so I somehow still like this vehicle. Do you? In this full review we'll tell you all you need to know about the recent Audi Q7 in exterior, interior and the driving experience here on Autogefühl with Thomas and we'll also have a special focus here today on the Q7 PHEV. Front grille, bigger than before and more in line also with the Audi Q8 for example, looks stronger now than the S line, adds those sportier contrast, especially the lower part, also with the black frame around here, then new headlamps, horizontally drawn, they start with LED, optional the matrix LED, also for more high beam functions and this one here is the new laser light which is now also available for the Q7. You can see it with the blue accentuations here and then you have even more high beam performance. The length of the Q7 is 5 meters 06, 16 foot 6 or 199 inches and comes standard with a steel suspension, optional also what we have in here, the air suspension. That one then varies 9 centimeters overall, so 6 centimeters up in the off-road mode, 3 centimeters down when you drive faster on the autobahn and it starts actually with 18 inch wheels goes up to 22 inch 19 with this s line and then this one is optional 21 inch and that looks pretty amazing not the biggest size what would be my tip yeah maybe 19 or 20 because then you have a little bit more comfort than with those but they will still look very nice. The S-Line badge right there, that also means those sporty contrast accentuations. You can see that the S-Line here has those wheel arches painted in the vehicle color. If you want it more off-roadish, you don't go for the S-Line, then you also have a contrast around the wheel arches. However, they are then also painted, but not in the vehicle color, but more in, you know, in this black or dark gray scheme. Interesting for the PHEV is also there is no rear axle steering available and no anti-roll control, which is usually an option in a, in, like in a suspension package. But here, due to packaging reason, not available for the PF. In the rear, there's a new modern signature here for the tail lamps. That looks really space style, you know, so pretty cool. And then also this bright strip that all goes around the vehicle. And those ones... Those are the definition of fake exhaust. And here you can charge the 17.3 kilowatt hour battery with a 7.4 kilowatt AC charger. This one here is the 3 liter 6 cylinder petrol engine, the 3 liter TFSI. That's very interesting, the strategy. And there are two horsepower outputs available actually in the 55 TFSIE, that's 375 horsepower, or in the 60. TFSIE, that's 450 horsepower. Each is the total system horsepower output, so pretty strong actually. And 
we'll be really excited how this one will be driving. And what's also interesting is when you have a two liter four cylinder at Audi and you have the Quattro all wheel drive, then you have this Quattro Ultra front plus rear on demand. But here then, when you have the three liter six cylinder engines, this is a classic Quattro 40, 60, you know, base distribution, so rear wheel biased all wheel drive. Well, to me, the true all wheel drive, yes, the new one might be a little bit more efficient or so. But this one, of course, will give you a little bit more rear wheel bias. Now to the interior. First of all, doors closing sound. Oh, amazing. This is a really very solid door closing sound. And you can see, by the way, the door here is really low. So that also protects the inside. Also those beautiful S-line badges from dirt. Then there's Alcantara at the inside of the doors here. You can get different decor elements, reasonable door pockets. There you can also open the normal fuel cap. And also right here, the, the trunk. Bangle Olufsen sound system. Yeah, it has a really nice sound tested it before, definitely. And the S line also more sporty accentuations. For example, here the perforated side of the steering wheel, animal skin seat here in this case. But the Q7 can also be bought with fabric seats as base, at least in Europe. And there's also in the normal S line, there would also be an Alcantara insert on the middle available. And there's also a sport seat available without the integrated head restraint that is already a little bit sportier. But not as sporty as this one, so you go base seat, more open than sport seat, little sportier with separate head restraint, and then this one here, the S sport seat with integrated head restraint. So this looks the sportiest, but I can tell you with this, you know, visually attractive quilting on the inside and the sportiest form of the seat, mm, it's to me at least not the best comfort then. So I would rather tell you to save some money and go for base style seats or the base sports seat if you want the most comfort. However, for a sports seat, it's still decently comfort comfortable because you sit upright, you have a lot of space in here. This platform here of the you know, VW Touareg, Porsche Cayenne and the Audi Q7, they all share the same platform, which has this absolutely even entry sill here. This somehow feels cool, you know, it doesn't go up or down, it's just all flat here to the bottom. Um, that's just, you know, a very special feeling when sitting here on the interior. Very clean setup here, definitely. Horizontal stress right there. Yeah, a lot of black piano lacquer is being used. Like this Quattro accentuation, this will also be illuminated, for example, but I would like to have something different than this black all over the place because it collects fingerprints and also a lot of dust and so on. But the overall design is pretty cool. Everything is touch-based, at least in this middle part. See, the range is ex at the moment also predicted with 50 km, 52 km. That's actually pretty decent. And then you can also change the view right here, depending on what you want to have. So you're pretty flexible as for this virtual cockpit. And you can also have this GPS view right here. So that's pretty cool and very helpful indeed. And they somehow also play together, this whole unit. So here, everything with a touch no control not or, or something this can be a problem when controlling it while driving for example then again it looks fancy and it's also quite intuitive to use that's good here with the satellite view if you have the basic view not the satellite view it will also be a little bit more responsive then you have this home menu but here i have to press no really press it in and i always recommend to go to the display settings here then go to the mmi and then deactivate this touchscreen feedback. Here, this haptic feedback for touch input. There we go. So, and then I can, you see the difference? I can just click like with a smartphone. And I mean, we are all used to smartphones. Why do you have to like bang, 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 bang on the touchscreen? It's so much, you know, easier just to use it like with an easy click. Then there will be Apple CarPlay, also wirelessly available. Alternatively, it also works with Android Auto, but not wireless yet. Go a little bit further down, this classic shifting lever that all works the very same way. Then you have the cup holders, which are high class and adaptive also. And then there's this armrest. You can slide forward a little bit. And when you put it up, then there's an inductive charging pad available and two classic USB-A devices for your smartphones. And the head-up display clear to read and the speed the allowed speed assistance system info and also some gps info so that's always a good option also the rear features here the alcantara at the inside of the door in the s line that's beautifully done then we also have for the kits here this manual sunshade like this oh, 
yeah, <laughs> there we go. Hold on again. And awesome build quality everywhere. What you touch and see and feel. They're really on top of the game here with the Q7, especially even more with the facelift. Then a lot of space at the back of the interior. And even here in the PHEV version, there's no compromise on the back seating in this normal back bench. There's no seven-seater option available here for the PHEV. That's not possible, but I mean, this will do just fine. You can get inside as well. And see here, I have plenty of leg room left when I would be driving even here and also with a more voluminous S sport seat. Then you're really flexible because you can slide the bench forward and backward. And that's actually possible for each individual seat. So you can also very well sit in the rear, one of the very few cars where you can sit as a tall adult in the middle seat perfectly. You can also just put this middle seat forward then. This is all possible to be flexible in you know, trunk length and the space you have here in the front available. Isofix here at the outside. It's also nicely covered as for that. And I mean, there is of course this transmission tunnel here, yes. But you can still sit pretty decently here. Also have an additional climate control in lower part, two 12 volt power supplies. And yeah, headroom is actually absolutely plentiful. And also the back part of the seats. I'll mention that too. You can put it a little bit straighter or more backwards if you, you know, want to go in a relaxing sleeping position. And this also goes, you know, a very, very wide way. And this would also be, you know, the possibility to flip the seats directly from here completely. Well, we have darker windows here in the rear area. Therefore, we cannot see it that well. But I can tell you at the moment, the top cover of the trunk is closed. And when I open the hatch right here, the cover automatically raises up, like here, and when I close it again, it goes down. That's a really great, comfortable function, definitely. When you have the air suspension, you can also lower the car a little bit here, that you have a lower loading niveau, so that's also handy. And pretty good in square dimensions, this trunk split. And there are actually two limitations here for the PHEV. One, there's no lower ground, so you cannot put anything up here. Usually you could put this one up, and again, there's no seven-seater option available. And the second limitation is this one here. So there's like an additional box you know, for the AC charger. So you're a little bit more limited in the space, in the, you know, in, in the width right there. But still, I mean, even at this point right there, it's not exactly one meters 20, but it's definitely more than a meter in width right here. And in the upper part, now, even a little bit more. So still, you know, you can get along with that very well. And the length of the trunk here is one meters and 14. The only thing that I don't like that much is when you have to flip the seats, you have to go all the way around. Then you have to, you know, release them from here and you have to do it individually. That's then the downside of this, um, you know, uh, bench setup like this. So there you can also see the difference. And the other possibility, as I said earlier, is that you can also push the bench forward. Then you could have a little bit longer trunk without flipping the seats, actually. But if we have them flipped to the front seats, as we would be driving as tall people, we know with Thomas and Jonas, that's then already about two meters. So overall, a very, very versatile car. The car is yeah, about you know 300 to 400 kilograms heavier than normal Q7 with the 3 liter TFSI turbo petrol engine, so you have to bear that in mind. However, this electric drive always transports some kinds of you know first of all tranquility you know because it's silent and also of you know lightness again you know because you hear nothing when you hit the throttle. There's this electric drive which does feel different from the combustion drive. The promised range is 640 kilometers on the combustion engine and about 50 kilometers on the pure electric drive. That would be about 400 miles combustion engine and about 30 miles as for the pure electric power. So overall I think you can very well live with it and the total system output here, I mean with this 60 TFSI E version giving us 450 horsepower. That's horsepower wise, you know, like it's an SQ7 alike. So um, really a lot of power, um, definitely very interesting. And you can also at the moment just drive pure electric. That's cool. And especially if you have the um, chance to re recharge it frequently. And 
the vehicle here, also with the air suspension, even without, you know, is a very calm one. You sit upright, have this comfortable seating position. You have a great um, noise insulation, so it's very, very silent in here. And it will also be this, the case at higher speeds. And this always fits somehow, you know, this premium elaborate feeling fits to an electric drive because at the moment here, especially in this car, I don't need any noise or something, you know. Then, especially here when stop and go, then it makes sense to have the electric drive once more because the electric motor doesn't care if it's now running or not. It's either zero or one, it's on or off, and there's no special friction, doesn't need to preheat or something. That's all good. And so we can really use the electric drive. You don't have the biggest boost from the electric drive here. Um, at some points you feel more resistance in the, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the throttle. And then it would turn over to the hybrid drive also with using the combustion engine. I felt that recently in the Mercedes GLE PHEV, that was a diesel PHEV and with a quite big battery actually, that this one was giving me more boost just from the electric drive. That was also, you know, pretty interesting. So let's now see on the motorway what happens when I push the throttle all the way through. I guess the combustion engine gets activated. Yeah, and that's the case. And now the thing is, that's not a clever thing to do. Um, well, on the one hand, because you have the PHEV, the first boost is covered by the electric drive. But then, of course, the combustion engine is being activated for the very first time, maybe, and is already now on higher RPMs. There are some protection measurements that it's not running at like a peak, R peak R R RPM or something to prevent some damages. And But still, I think it's not the best thing to do. But they have this function here in because for, let's say, oh, there's likely lane change and I really need to get on before another car is there or something. Then for safety reasons, they offer this automatic boost that the combustion engine uh, joins the electric drivetrain. If you like a situation like this, you're just rolling <laughs> behind this boat there. Um, for example, set the cruise control um, like this and there's also adaptive cruise control in here. And you're just rolling, don't need too much power, additional power. Then you can also use the EV mode on the, on the motorway, you know, the cars just rolling or coasting and that's also fine for the EV mode then. And then you can also be actually quite efficient. However, yes, a combustion engine is more efficient on the motorway because the best efficiency point for a combustion engine would be about 90 kilometers an hour. So, um, actually the car is in the hybrid mode now. So yeah, I can also, just when I use this lower button, switch between EV and hybrid. And here now in the hybrid mode, now I can see those yellow symbols there in the, in the, the dashboard. And now we are running on the combustion engine. Now again on the GEV because we're rolling, re speed's been reduced. So it switches then constantly when you are in this hybrid mode, depending on the situation. I told you earlier, this car does have some performance from the combined power then. So as soon as this small construction site is over, I'll accelerate it out. Do I miss the all-wheel steering, which is not available for the, well, the rear access steering, which is not available for the PF? Yeah, on the motorway doesn't, play such a role but I do somehow miss it when you know driving around in the city and so on. The combustion engine maybe you I'm not sure if you could pick it up on camera now it actually is running but it's also so well insulated from the cabin you also don't hear it that much so pretty much feels like driving a normal Q7 so there's not a big difference. It will more play a role if you in your country have special subsidiaries from the government, tax benefits or something for the PHEV, then it makes sense financially. And manufacturers, especially in Europe, try to price those PHEV very well because they know when they exceed the fleet, overall the fleet CO2 output, they have to pay a fees or fines to even that out. And when they produce PHEVs, they can actually even that out, even that out pretty much. So it does also pay off for the manufacturers to offer those at a rather attractive price. It's also a very, very interesting aspect. So what I want to show you here, go to the right lane here now, because 
I'll show you the blind spot monitor when the car is appearing right here then it okay let's see about that so there should be the blind spot monitor appearing but it seems that it's not activated driver assist basic maximum ah there it is live and audio through guys there we have the blind spot monitor and when I also used it the turning indicator then it's also flashing actually to give me an additional warning and now there's also unlimited speed so we can use actually for example the sport mode dynamic then the shifting is also according to that and we have the maximum power oh there's a new GLE coming no sorry look different it was a new X class they look pretty similar from the front interesting now let's accelerate it out Sixty kilometers. Wow. So what? That was eighty kilometers now to one hundred sixty, and pretty powerful. And what I felt is we got first some electric punch, then more or less the combustion engine took it all over, and that's yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. So indeed, this can also be an alternative to like an SQ7 to a performance model, which especially you know think about the European new diesel regulations. Where they limit the you know output that can come to the filter and yeah they were struggling recently they're using now some software updates but the latest performance diesel models were all not performing that well and so this pf model could indeed be a good alternative to that yeah at the same time mostly you maybe don't want to force it that much and then you can keep it you know just rolling go to the comfort mode again and then for example also use the recuperation other than that the steering is quite direct and although it's set on the comfort tone it's fun to do some slalom here with the Q7 there's a good steering feel good steering input as well and the handling is fantastic I mean we have a great suspension from this air suspension uh, a great comfort from the air suspension in the auto mode really did me not Fix everything itself in the dynamic mode. The car set a little bit lower. Now I get more stiffer feedback, so that's less comfort than, but you know, more connection to the road. So you can pick that how how you would like to have it. Definitely cool. And the, yeah, off road would also be possible. Then, you know, raising it up, but that doesn't increase the comfort by the way. So if you have, you know, because there's like positive and negative travel always, and you need both to have a good comfort. But definitely interesting you know i was just letting it roll and we were about 22 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers again that's a realistic electric vehicle uh, fuel consumption and i just enjoy driving the q7 all electric again the biggest difference i feel from this one to the gle of course it has a different styling feeling so to say but the gle has the way better battery so it's like double the size and also double the range so that's a big difference and you know this what I meant here. Um, when I want a real punch from this car, I need the combustion engine. <laughs> the, the electric drive is um, um, not for that. Yeah, Jonas is a little bit sick today, so um, maybe have some best wishes for Jonas in the comments. Then you will get well in no time. So with the GLE, you can have an all-electric punch because you have more battery capacity available and so they set it up in that way and here they set up the car in a way that even if you are in the pure EV mode the combustion engine sets in at the point you know we can um, try it again switch to the pure EV mode and see how the acceleration turns out and now not try to hammer it all the way through directly I say let's just test yeah I see it comes it comes it comes and then yeah and then there's like a really um, like resistance in the throttle when I push through that then the combustion engine turns on so the all electric drive more for rolling coasting driving slowly but no real acceleration possible in a GLE PF again it was possible to have a real 
good traffic lights, sit acceleration situations or something just with the electric drive. So depends definitely on the on the user profile what you want to have. Both cars are very interesting to drive definitely and also offering you sportiness and comfort at the same time. The GLE is more set a little bit more on, on, on comfort and this one here is actually already quite sporty and do I feel the additional weight? It's hard to say. I mean this car is heavy anyway so there's not much difference in there. Um, I think driving wise you do feel a difference when you have the rear axle steering or not. Yes. If there's no more weight or not, hmm, I don't know. As I said initially, it also feels you know, so silent and refined in here that the electric drivetrain also makes you relax a little bit more. Maybe even that brings down the fuel consumption a little bit. That would also be you know, a funny finding for sure, you know. And now to our conclusion for today with the Audi Q7 facelift and the special focus on the Q7 p -Hef. First of all, in the exterior styling, this facelift brings more strength to the whole car and, well, not maybe in the S-Line, but in the other version, it looks more SUV, more off-roadish and less as a van, maybe as before. In the S-Line then, more sporty accentuations. It also depends on which size of the wheels you pick, of course. But definitely here also with the painted wheel arches than a sportier style. And a nice contrast here with the black pack as well, so that fits very well to this white color. On the interior, high build quality as we used to. Now with those infotainment system upgrades makes it a modern car. There's no interior differentiation as for the infotainment now anymore between Q7 and Q8. Yeah, you can argue with the MMI not before you could control stuff better while driving. However, the menu structure is pretty easy, so you can find the things pretty fast, and that's also good. And also with the upgraded voice input, that helps. Overall, I get along with the system pretty well, I have to say. Good comfort, also great riding comfort. And this one is, although it's a pretty heavy car, even heavier as a PF, still it feels somehow easy and agile to drive. And the thing is, with this power here, you maybe saw the small clip from the action cam from the acceleration 0 to 60 kilometers an hour, and that was in you know heavy rain. Still, this all-wheel drive was managing that very well. Also good to has an advantage to have the classic all-wheel drive 46% base distribution, then adapting in just a little bit. Together with the big 3-liter 6-cylinder engine, I think that's a good mix overall. Yeah, I mean, when they could put a bigger battery in there, you can have an even higher electric range. The Mercedes GLE is a good um, example for that with a double, uh, you know, double the size of the battery and also double the range. Here about, you know, 50 kilometers or 30 miles, it is indeed realistic. And you don't have the real electric punch, the pure electric one. That's not how this car is laid out, which you would have in the GLE then with a pure electric punch, you know, from the traffic light and maybe some you know, uh, gaps you want to fill in there. But then again, most of the time I could still drive all electric because in the normal traffic situations you don't have so many situations where you like hammer it all the way through, even on the Germany. So you can use the electric drive train quite a lot, especially if you're commuting short ways or for inner city, city uh, drives that you can reduce emissions locally. And you always have the recuperation possibility that even when the battery is depleted, you will can still lower the fuel consumption by using the recuperation. Then again, something from the battery, especially for the you know, first few meters and so on. So this can be useful if it fits to your driving profile. And overall, definitely a very interesting drive here today. What's your take on that one here? The Q7 p have, And of course, it might even be an alternative to the... Um, you know, especially when you use the hybrid mode, to the powerful alternatives because, I mean, that was a really a strong acceleration we had here in this combination with the total system output. The BMW X5 is fine before and after the facelift. The main difference is the new infotainment, which now lacks physical climate dials, but delivers a more stable wireless CarPlay connection. Exterior, interior and driving are very refined. They offer the best seats and the most comfortable ones, but yet most sustainable seating materials. Also, BMW has moved up in the reliability rankings recently. 
the BMW X6 is the coupe version. Here again the looks are sportier, but you don't lose much. The Mercedes GLE is slightly facelifted. It gives you a smooth Mercedes ride together with its bigger GLS brother. And I personally love the exterior. If you pick SUV or coupe body shape, it's personal preference. There's not a huge difference in practicality. Mercedes also offers animal free seating. The Audi Q8 received a lamp update, that's how we have to call it, that facelift. It has a straightforward user interface and the sport you ride. The bigger brother is the Audi Q7 if you need more space in the rear and in the trunk. The VW Touareg is the least expensive sibling among VW, Audi, Porsche and Bentley. It also has the least sporty approach in the ride. Best price performance for this platform at least. The Range Rover Sport is in the way the most unique one in this comparison. It also has the typical command driving position of a Range Rover and good seating options. Steering feel and reliability figures are a little off however. The Volvo XC90 is still pretty nice. With the infotainment updates you still have a versatile car with modern features. Just suspension and steering cannot keep up with the Germans for example. The Porsche Cayenne is the most expensive one in the test here. It features a great sporty ride for sure, a lot of fun, but the extremely high extra feature prices aren't really justified. Remember, the Touareg basically employs the same tech. All these SUVs are very impressive and premium products. However, if I combine interior comfort and materials, refinement of the ride and fun, and then also the pricing, which is not cheap at all with any of those, and still some are even more expensive. So overall then, my pick would be the BMW X5. If you want the sporty look and the SUV coupe approach, then the X6. Which one would you pick and why? Tell me in the comments and join us also for more comparison reviews.